Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first iteration of our crypto asset, and, asset analytics workshop, which we this year co-located with the web conference. My name is Bernhard Haselhofer, and I'm uh, one of the co-organizers and also uh, one of the PC chairs uh, of this workshop. Obviously, I'm not alone. Uh, I, we organized this workshop as a team, a team of um, five people who have been actively working in this field for several years. So besides me, so I'm the second here in a row, Bernhard Hasselhofer from Complexity Science Hub Vienna. There's also Friedhelm Victor from TU Berlin, Surav Svinkupta from NTU Singapore, Malte Mercer from Genesis, uh, and Rainer Böhme from University of Innsbruck. So we decided to uh, organize this workshop and maybe um, just to give an intuition why uh, we decided to organize this workshop. As I said before, we are all working in this field for quite some time. I think Rainer Böhmer wrote his first Bitcoin-related paper in 2012 or 2013. And also the other um, um, workshop organizers have quite some publication history in this field, uh, but mostly in um, security-related conferences. And what we observed in recent years is that the topic uh, of crypto assets in general um, somehow has become a more mainstream topic and a topic that also deserves um, to be discussed on a more general computer science conference. And for this reason, we thought that uh, the web conference is a very nice fit. And there is also another reason um, we also observed, and if you follow the media, you probably agree, um, that the public debate around uh, crypto assets is very much driven by beliefs, hopes, expectations, business interests. And uh, with this workshop, we also want to establish a venue um, where debates and discussions um, can be um, organized let's say, in a more scientifically uh, grounded fashion. So this was probably the second motivation why I decided to organize this workshop as part of the web conference. <clears throat> um, let me start by explaining um, what we mean when we talk about um, crypto assets and crypto asset analytics in general. So what are crypto assets? Um, there are, in fact, many definitions out there. If you look into regulatory or policy white papers, you'll find plenty of definitions. And to the best of our knowledge, there is no single agreed upon definition. So what we do is we simply draw from several definitions and came up with our own. And uh, we basically define crypto assets as, as some kind of virtual exchangeable virtual asset that utilize cryptography and represent some economic resource over you to someone. And uh, at the moment, uh, most crypto assets uh, build on some form of blockchain technology, which uh, is also a term many people might be familiar with. We can also um, roughly divide the spectrum of crypto assets in several sub categories. On the one side, we have uh, native cryptocurrencies with um, transparent examples like Bitcoin or Bitcoin um, derivatives like Litecoin or, or Bitcoin Cash. And we also have uh, privacy focused coins like Zcash and Monero. So these all fall into what we call the category of native cryptocurrencies. And on the other side, uh, we have um, tokens. Um, and there we distinguish roughly between fungible tokens, as you know, some of you might know, stable coins, for instance, which are an example of fungible tokens, and um, there are non fungible tokens, which um, have gained a lot of media attention recently because these are the constructs that are used for uh, selling and trading digital artworks, for instance, uh, recently. So, this is the rough spectrum of uh, crypto assets. And also on a technical level, um, we just can distinguish between two main architectures. We have uh, UTXO, UTXO model ledgers um, that is basically um, technology um, that is used in Bitcoin and related cryptocurrencies. And then we have um, account model ledgers with Ethereum being uh, the, pros, the most prominent uh, representative. So this is um, what we understand under the term crypto assets roughly. And of course, um, we do not 
conceive uh, crypto assets as being isolated atomic units floating around somewhere. Um, crypto assets are part of a larger ecosystem. So crypto assets are bought and sold at exchanges. They are used to buy uh, goods and services in legal and illegal marketplaces. Um, they are used to trade, uh, to speculate. So um, when we talk about crypto asset ecosystems, what you mean is actually um, a community of actors uh, who interact as a system and are linked together through crypto asset transfers. So we conceive crypto assets as being something that's being part of a larger ecosystem, um, which of course raises a lot of questions um, to be answered um, in a scientific way. And the goal or the idea of crypto asset analytics, so this is the theme of this workshop, is um, to think about new methods, so we all have most uh, we are mostly computer scientists and we most have mostly have quantitative backgrounds so we're mostly talking about quantitative methods and we want to apply uh, these methods to better understand the technical and socioeconomic aspects of crypto asset ecosystems so this is um, what we also wrote in our workshop proposal this should be the goal of the workshop and why is this important um, we have observed in recent years that uh, analyzing crypto assets is important for a number of use cases and application fields. So you have a need for understanding markets. Um, so there are actors um, who are, of course, un interested in understanding how uh, certain crypto assets are evolving compared to others. There is also um, the application field of law enforcement because not all um, crypto asset transactions are legal, as you might know when you follow the media. There's a lot of hacks going on and Crypto assets are unfortunately also used for illegal activities and law enforcement has to go after this. Um, we also noticed that um, being able to um, empirically analyze um, what's going on in deployed crypto asset ecosystem is also important for protocol designers. So for instance, um, people who work on proof of stake protocols, they are interested how stake distribution looks in the real world in the wild and they also um, rely on some analytics methods uh, to gain insight into this process and of course there's this field of uh, aml so anti-money laundering and compliance uh, whoever runs a business nowadays dealing with uh, crypto assets must think about uh, money laundry prevention um, terrorism financing prevention and uh, must implement uh, compliance standards in order to fulfill um, existing and upcoming uh, regulations. So these are just four examples for application fields. And uh, we think um, that this is important and a reason uh, to organize this workshop. I'm now handing over to you, Malte, to... Sure, do continue. you want to show the full slide? Um... Perfect. Um, I think, yeah, hello from my side as well. Um, for me personally, one of the most interesting things about this whole space, I think, is, is how all those um, technologies um, become more and more relevant for, for the web at large. So we're moving away from users having to host their own node on their computer at home and only having their Bitcoin client available to send back and forth, but we're seeing more and more of that technology actually being pushed into the browsers and pushed into people's devices and just having that accessibility of these technologies uh, more and more available, um, I think creates a huge potential um, for the actual use. But of course, that also raises a bunch of interesting and important questions. There are questions about standardization. There are questions about the security. Um, you might have heard recently about Apple iCloud users um, getting hacked because their MetaMask um, wallets were exposed to hackers through that way. And of course, that then comes with like potentially huge losses. And there are all kinds of like interesting questions for privacy. Um, privacy on the web isn't always great. Privacy on cryptocurrencies definitely isn't great. And so when these two um, areas combine, I think there are lots of new questions that we have to answer. And so that is, if you want to go to the next slide, um, one of the big reasons for why we are organizing this workshop, we want to bring together 
um, academic researchers from all kinds of different disciplines that ha might have different lenses on all of these um, different aspects and give them kind of a venue to present their newest findings related to these ecosystems and these technologies. And the original or our idea was to have just a variety of different um, topics that we want to talk about here. There could be empirical studies about things that are going on. We're very interested, of course, in, in methods and tools as researchers. How can we better um, analyze what is going on there and what are the insights that we can get? Um, case studies and use cases, I think, will become more and more important as we look more into um, what is actually happening at that intersection of, of the web and crypto. And then, of course, um, just data sets in general are always very interesting process researchers. What can we learn from um, interesting data sets that are out there? And so I think we've compiled a very interesting workshop. We have two sessions today, um, three paper talks, two invited talks. And I believe I'll, had, I'll give it over to Reiner to introduce the first invited talk. All right, thank you very much. And I'm very excited to have uh, Arthur Gervais here. Uh, Arthur is uh, um, yeah, a, a well-known name in the uh, crypto analytics or crypto asset analytics space. Um, he has uh, made some uh, landmark contributions. I think the first uh, contribution that rose my interest was his uh, major or general blockchain security simulator at the time when everything happened on, let's say, the first layer. And only recently he um, proposed uh, ways to, for example, automatically detect uh, minor extractable value um, in, at a large scale in the, in the DeFi ecosystem. And uh, so I'm sure that today he's going to share some of these insights as long as well as other things um, in the invited uh, keynote. Um, a little bit of the bio, um, Arthur is a lecturer at Imperial College London, also a lecturer at the University of uh, Lucerne, and he also uh, runs a startup, uh, well, it's not a startup anymore, it's a, uh, already five years old, um, a blockchain scalability solution, it's called uh, Liquidity Networks. Also, Arthur is one of the uh, lecturers in a major massive online course taught uh, together with Berkeley, uh, on decentralized finance, so we could not imagine a more competent and authoritative uh, speaker in this field. So thank you, Arthur, for accepting our invitation. Uh, this is a small but elect audience, I guess, and so we are looking forward to your talk uh, very much. The stage is yours. We don't hear you, Arthur. You're on mute. Oh, so, excuse me. Um, uh, thank you, Reinhard, so much for your very kind introduction, really humble. Um, uh, can everybody see the, the slide uh, that I put in full screen now? Yes, we can hear you and we can see the slides. Very good. So, so just as Bernhard uh, and, and, and Malte outlined, right, the space is full of praise. <laughs> uh, they're good guys, they're bad guys. And okay, what's good and what's bad is, is, is maybe subjective at times. Um, but um, there are so-called... Um, um, how, to, how to say like the at least the the peer to peer network where where people trade on these decentralized ledgers is is quite opaque um, to to outsiders. Um, so we are, for example, we are running um, we are running um, Ethereum nodes that connect to to a set of nodes in the network to gather data for our papers. We just like this morning, for instance, I just saw oh we got a we got a DOS attack uh, from one particular peer that just randomly sent us like half a million transaction hashes just within like a few seconds. Um, like these, these things appear on the network and they have a reason, right? Uh, this is an adversarial environment where everybody can join and leave the network at any point in time. So our job and, and what we try to do in our work is to, to bring a bit more light into this obscure environment. Um, and today we're gonna focus mostly on, on blockchain extractable value um, which is uh, which was introduced by Diane et al. It's uh, as a concept initially as a concept of minor extractable value, um, but it's not only miners that can extract. You also, as a trader, if you're not a miner, you can also extract it, right? So it's a it's a bit more broader than this. And um, the concept of high frequency trading in decentralized finance stems from the fact that there are so so called front and back running attempts, which we will look in in, the, in this presentation. 
um, but it's not really high frequency in traditional as in traditional terms, right? The the frequency or the the, the speed of transaction propagation is much slower than in the traditional HFT environment. So please don't confuse it with the uh, co-location to, to centralized exchanges and high frequency trading there, right? So just to be um, to avoid any confusion there. Okay, very good. So let's jump on the uh, a bit, yeah, uh, on the on the traditional side, right? Um, we uh, we most likely all know uh, Mike Lewis and his uh, work on Flash Boys. Um, so this was one of the works that kind of um, explained what uh, what 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 can go wrong on, on Wall Street or what can be done to to gain an unfair advantage over other traders. Um, and uh, there are a lot of uh, very, very, very creative market manipulation techniques that um, that came about. Um, I actually recommend you to go, uh, I think it's investopedia.com. They have a list of all the market manipulation techniques that you can look into. It's very creative. It's like, it's quite quite fun to see how how these um, actors came up with, with different names and different techniques, um, things that I would have never thought about. So it's, it's quite educative, I would say. Um, and um, because of these manipulations, there they, they, they came about regulations. Uh, and the SEC, as far as I understand, is one of those entities that uh, tries to enforce regulations um, in the US, not, not in Europe, um, hopefully. <laughs> um, but uh, so there were some, some high frequency trading firms, for example, that, uh, that got uh, fined to pay um, certain penalties for, for, for so-called market manipulation techniques. Um, and what we can also see nowadays is the emergence of more stringent regulations to protect uh, consumers. So for instance, if you open a bank account uh, nowadays, or if you open a, um, like a portfolio where you can invest, um, there, there are a lot of regulations of what should the bank do and what should it not do uh, in terms of um, in terms of uh, in terms of guiding you or not guiding you. Uh, so MyFit is one of these regulations. So I'm really not an expert in this. I guess Reiner knows this much better. But I I did open a bank account I think like three years ago with with a with a brokerage account um, and so to invest in stocks and they asked me a, a ton of questions that they've never asked me before. So I assume this was one of the results of, of these oncoming regulations, right? So how I at least uh, felt it. It's a few, it's a few years ago, um, but I think they already tried to be compliant with MyFit too, if I understand correctly. Okay, so this is the more traditional world, right? Let's jump into the, the crypto world um, or the pendant at least. Uh, as we all know, everything started with Bitcoin. Uh, the seminal paper with, of, of Satoshi Nakamoto. Um, okay, I have to be cautious. Not everything started with uh, Bitcoin. Obviously, there were like decades of efforts prior to that where uh, the entire community um, has worked towards a Bitcoin, uh, we could say even. Uh, so one of the obviously great achievements was then to put everything together into Bitcoin. And since then, we have gotten, uh, we've received more uh, traditional smart contracts in, the, in, for example, in blockchains such as Ethereum, um, while Bitcoin already supported smart contracts, but they were much easier to program in, in Ethereum and to instantiate. Um, and um, so this led to the fruition of decentralized finance. Um, so decentralized finance really builds on top of this distributed database. And it has a, a variety of layers. So I'm just ignoring here the, the network layer for now, uh, the, the hardware layer for now, but we do have a network layer. So this is where the information gets propagated among the peers. Um, here I write or I portray it as a peer-to-peer -peer layer. Um, we will see later in my talk that there are some efforts that has been going on that centralize those networks considerably, um, but at least from its design, it's supposed to be a peer-to-peer -peer layer. Um, then there's a blockchain consensus layer, um, which may be proof of work or proof of stake or Nakamoto consensus or a variety of different techniques. And on top of this, we have the application logic state. So this is where you can define, for example, I have a, I have a balance of an account A and um, I will give uh, a certain amount of coins to the account B uh, for example, every day, right? So this could be a simple contract. 
that uh, that defines such a such a transfer, a temporal transfer. Uh, so these are things or logic logic applications that you can install uh, on the blockchain, right? And then different people can interact. Um, the beauty here is we don't have any, or we should have the least amount of trusted intermediaries, right? That's the goal of uh, these distributed ledgers. Um, so if a person A and B wants to interact, they can do this through the ledger, which acts as a third party, uh, but it should be a, a neutral or um, yeah, a trusted third party in the sense that you can trust the code uh, that, it, that it executes. Now with this base, which, um, which allows you to develop applications, we can see the DeFi emerged. And DeFi is in essence, an accumulation of a variety of financial smart contracts. So for instance, you have uh, exchange smart contracts. The most, one of the most well-knowns are automated market makers such as uh, invented by, um, or proposed first on, on Ethereum by Bancor and Uniswap. Um, so these are rather standard smart contracts that exchange assets between, um, between entities. We also have uh, lending protocols, so you can. Um, uh, what's very uh, what's very common in, in in the traditional financial world are is debt, right? Um, and debt can be created on chain nowadays. Um, there are two types of debt. There's the under collateralized debt version and the over collateralized debt version. So, if you over collateralize, it means you you. You, your collateral value is bigger than the debt value. Right? So it still allows you to create leverage for yourself, right? You can gain additional exposure. Um, but they're, they're equivalently, there are also under collateralized uh, lending platforms nowadays where you can have um, leverage beyond 2x. So this is the, the amount of exposure that you can increase and also the risk that you can, can increase uh, when lending and borrowing. One very interesting new concept is the concept of flash loans. Uh, these are loans that are only valid within a single atomic transaction. Uh, so it means if you have like three actions within a transaction, you can take the loan and then do something with it and you have to repay it by the end. So if you don't repay it by the end, then the entire transaction, which is atomic, fails. Um, so this is something I haven't seen in the traditional world. It may be enforceable with contract, legal contracts in the traditional world, but um, yeah, very, very interesting concept. Um, stable coins, I'm sure everybody heard of this. So I won't go into all of these um, financial products, but to give you a high level picture, they all support the same asset standards. And that's beautiful. Like the entire DeFi ecosystem is following community driven asset standards. Right? And I'm, I'm always amazed by how well this works because we don't have a central entity that defines those standards like the ERC-20 or uh, non-fungible token standards that, that Ben had uh, mentioned earlier. Um, so it's quite, it's quite nice to have these standards because given those standards, all the DeFi protocols can be intertwined and then they become composable and then it gets very complicated. <laughs> and, and so it's, it's money legal at the end of the day. Um, so naturally, once we have this financial ecosystem, if there are a few market mechanisms that, uh, that, uh, that evolve, like arbitrage is, for instance, the process of buying and selling um, coins um, on, on different markets. So to equilibrate the price, right? that's considered a benign technique as it helps the market to, to become more liquid, um, uh, to become more efficient, not, not necessarily more liquid. Um, there are also liquidations. So if you borrow something and the collateral of your value drops, um, then you might get liquidated, right? So it says if you, if you borrow money and you put your house as a collateral, but the value of your house declines because of some, whatever, some storm or some, some concern, then it could happen that your house will be sold, right? By the bank that granted you a loan. So that's the same concept on chain. So liquidations exist on chain in a, in a very similar way. Um, I'm sure you've heard about governance and DAOs. So uh, there's a lot of voting going on um, in, in decentralized finance. There's also a lot of bribing going on. So if you do have some so-called locked token in a system and you have some voting power, 
then there will be bribes uh, where you get paid to vote to a certain outcome, uh, which is a very common thing nowadays in DeFi. Okay, good. So I think this was a rough overview of, of what DeFi uh, presents. So you might ask, well, what is this BEV or blockchain extractable value? So we have already discussed that there are so-called lending protocols, right? And if the collateral um, price drops below a certain factor, which is typically referred as the health factor, then your loan can become uh, can can be opened up for liquidation. And then the question is, who will perform that liquidation? So who has the authority uh, to liquidate? Well, in as it's a permissionless system. Technically, anyone could liquidate, and it can be a miner, but it can also be a trader. It can be a, uh, like a regular trader. Right? Uh, it can be someone who who tries to um, who tries to. Uh, it can be the oracle provider, for instance, uh, or it can be some um, um, so-called high-frequency trader. Yeah, um, but it, it's technically it can be anyone, right? Anyone who can issue a transaction on the ledger or who can reorder transactions on the network layer or on, on the blockchain layer can, um, can uh, perform such liquidation. So it's, it's really an open game. Um, and the value that is being extracted from a liquidation, so the profit, this is blockchain extractable value. Right? Um, so I've mentioned that transaction ordering might be relevant. So why is that the case? Well. If you look at this particular um, instance here where a miner receives transaction one, two, three in this very order, then the miner may want to choose to order these transactions in a different order in the block. Right? So you could say this is maybe not the fair uh, order sequence. However, defining fairness by itself is probably not trivial. Um, Yet, what de facto happens in nowadays blockchain clients, uh, namely um, Geth and Aragon, for instance, is that the miners are ordering transactions um, with the preference given to the transactions that pay the highest transaction fees. In Ethereum, that is gas. So the higher the gas that's being paid, the earlier the position um, this transaction receives in the block. Right? So you might then say, well, transaction two here likely paid a higher transaction fee than one and three, right? So that's the order by which miners um, order transactions. So we looked into historical data and found that roughly 80% of the blocks um, um, follow this kind of schema. But I, I believe that this, this data has changed in recent times especially due to the introduction of um, these um, front running as a service providers. So I take this number with, with a grain of salt um, because the environment has changed in, in the recent months. Yeah. Okay, so what's important to, to take away is that miners retain the privilege to control single-handedly the transaction order, right? There's no consensus about the order. It's a, it's a kind of like a, yeah, it's a single-handed authority that the miner has once a miner is, uh, is, is mining a block, right? Um, so there's not specifically a consensus about which, which transaction order we should abide by in a network. Very good. So, okay, we know roughly what, what this BEV represents, right? It means you can extract value, for example, from liquidations um, you buy front running or by reordering transactions so that you make sure that you get the correct blockchain state to extract value. And you might ask, well, how much was extracted? What is What are the amounts, right? Um, um, what are the amounts? So over 32 months, so we measured from December 2018 to August 2021, uh, we found a profit of about half a billion uh, US dollar. Uh, this is by simply looking on chain. So we have an archive node where we can um, look at look at uh, the previous blockchain states, and we have a set of heuristics. So these numbers are not perfect, and we don't have any ground truth. So this is also something you you may consider 
when looking at the validity of these results. But we have uh, we have set a certain set of heuristics to identify whether a transaction yields blockchain extractable value. Um, for example, in the terms of uh, of liquidations, and um, how much was extracted for from the from the uh, trader or the miner in that sense. We looked at um, about uh, eleven thousand unique addresses um, that uh, that performed such actions. Uh, we captured fifty thousand cryptocurrencies and sixty thousand on-chain markets. Um, so the reason why we went to so many cryptocurrencies is because. Initially, we, we just used a few thousand. We just looked at a few thousand cryptocurrencies. But we realized that the, the blockchain extractable value grew quite significantly once we looked at dozens, um, I mean, tens of thousands of cryptocurrencies. So that's also something that we researchers, we never really know, right? I mean, how much do we need to capture to, to give a representative image? And we realized we, we needed much more. Um, you can... You can see a preprint of our paper, I think, with less cryptocurrencies, and you can you can look at the diff if you're curious about the, the difference. Yeah. So which ones are the main BV sources we looked at? So we have four. Um, three of them are sandwich attacks, liquidation, and arbitrage. I will get back into the fourth one a bit later in the talk. Um, and uh, yeah, let's look into, um, for example, sandwich attacks. But to understand sandwich attacks, we first have to understand how, a, how an automated market maker or a decentralized exchange uh, works. So the idea of a decentralized exchange is that you have a, you have a, a pot of money, like a supply of money, uh, which is in a smart contract. So, uh, so you have two assets, X and Y, and these are held by the smart contract. The way that the smart contract accepts and gives out assets from this pot of money is by following the constant product formula. So X times Y should remain constant. And X is the quantity of the asset X and Y the quantity of the asset Y in this particular case. So the advantage of such, a, such an AMM is that we have instant liquidity. That's a, a concept um, named, I mean, liquidity, means financial assets so we can instantly buy and and sell assets to this pool irrespective of the trade size so it's a bit simplified because the more you buy the higher your price becomes per unit of the asset that you that you purchase um, so you get instant liquidity which is beautiful which you don't get in a limit order book necessarily and which is a traditional exchange model um, but the, there's a caveat, which is that the, the price of the trade increases the, the larger the, the volume that you would like to execute. So naturally, as in any market, so if you purchase asset X, it increases the price of X. And vice versa, it decreases the price of Y. Um, so uh, what's simple about the AMM is that the ratio of the asset X and Y, and y sets the price in this very market. Okay, enough theory about AMMs. So let's look at, at a concrete example. Um, in this slide, we're going to look here on the X axis. We have the amount X of the asset X in the pool, which is the AMM pool governed by the smart contract. And on the Y axis, we have the asset Y. The current state is 30-10. So 30 assets um, of the asset Y and 10 assets of the asset X, hence the constant. K is 300. Now, if we want to go, if we want to receive um, um, 10 assets of the asset Y, how many assets of the asset X do we have to provide to the pool? So here we would like to remove 10. So we go to 20, right? We remove 10 from the pool. How many assets of, uh, of the asset X do we have to provide to the smart contract for the smart contract to be happy to perform such trade with us? Any idea? You can... Sorry, I heard the number. Five. Yes, very good, exactly, right? Um, oops, I'm jumping. So by 
by adding five assets to the pool, we abide by the so-called bonding curve of this AMM. And uh, we can get 10 assets uh, from the same back, right? So the state afterwards will be 15, 20, and K, the constant remains constant. Now, I was not super precise. The, the constant K can change. Uh, there are two instances where it can change. The first is if you add liquidity to the pool so, or remove liquidity from the pool, the constant K can change. And naturally, if you pay transaction fees to the pool for making a swap, then you're adding liquidity to the pool, which will also slightly change K. But for performing to perform the trade, as we just have uh, looked at, K should remain constant. Very good. Um, all right, so we have here this happy trader. Uh, he provides five assets to the pool. He gets ten assets back, and and his his trade is is um, moving the price point on this uh, on this curve. I mean, you could also say um, probably mathematically more correct maybe to say that uh, the 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 um, yeah. I mean, there's not not a single point, right? It's the the entire the entire bonding curve that's considered in this trade. So the larger the, the volume, so you can see here, the the flatter kind of the curve becomes if you take the tangent uh, on that on that curve. Now, to discuss sandwich attacks, um, we will we will introduce two adversarial traders. So these two here. Um, they will perform a transaction A1, this is the adversarial transaction A1, and the adversarial transaction A2 after the victim. So we have the victim here um, that's being pushed down the bonding curve by the transaction A1. And there's a so-called slippage protection, which the victim has set. So the slip, the, the victim specified, I am not willing to pay more than X, X whatever is the price, uh, uh, for my particular trade, right? So, and this will define the slippage protection of the victim. Now you can see in the, in the sandwich attack, the adversary pushes the victim and then sells back the position and thereby making effectively, um, I mean, squeezing out a profit or the, the tolerance that the victim was willing to give. So in this particular case, we assume, so these numbers are more or less made up, but we assume that the victim was happy to have a one-to-one -one ratio. Um, and uh, because of the sandwich attack, he lost five assets, right? while, the, um, while the sandwich attacker gained three assets. So the, the name sandwich comes from the fact that we have kind of two breads and we have a juicy piece of meat in the middle, which is the victim. And we squeeze out the slippage tolerance um, out of this particular victim transaction. Now, if you, if you visit DEX websites, you can, you can set your slippage tolerance on, on these websites. Um, you could set it to zero, but the problem is then that your transaction may execute at a state that is no longer the no longer the state that you had locally uh, while you were ex while you were triggering the transaction, so your transaction may fail. Um, so the slippage can or should likely not be zero, right? Your slippage tolerance should likely be small, but it's it's hard to quantify what's the ideal slippage. It also depends on the market state, on the network conditions, on your trade size, etc. There are a few variables to take into account. Okay, any questions on sandwich attacks? Very good. Then um, what have we found? So we have looked at the historical uh, data regarding sandwich attacks, and we found here uh, on um, about five uh, DEXs, so Banco, Uniswap, SushiSwap, we found uh, these particular amounts, right? Uh, you can see here, this is a log scale on the y-axis. So we have found uh, per month, um, um, a monthly profit beyond 10 million US dollar that uh, sandwich attackers have been able to extract. So these are quite significant amounts. And they have increased in particular here, you can see after the emergence of uh, Uniswap version two, which is still quite dominant um, 
uh, even after the launch of Uniswap version three. Okay. The other type of BEV that we looked at are liquidations. So liquidation is considered a benign uh, trading activity, uh, contrary to sandwich attacks. And what we found is here that um, uh, there are particularly interesting dates, for example, March uh, 2020, um, and um, here May 2021. So these are quite specific, um, yeah, almost outliers. Um, and there were also, uh, uh, so one, one specific platform we don't consider here actually is uh, MakerDAO, uh, which you probably uh, should add as well because they had a, an outlier event also in March 2020. But what you can see here is the, the overall liquidation amounts are uh, beyond eight, 80 million US dollar, right? This is what you can see uh, if you just accumulate all these um, liquidation platforms. So these liquidation platforms are the fixed spread liquidation events. Um, they're relatively easy to quantify, easy to identify on chain because you have EVM events and you can, uh, you can very clearly identify them without false positives. So that's, that's uh, beautiful for us researchers. But there are also additionally, for example, MakerDAO, there's a, an auction process that takes a, a few days that may be more complicated to capture, but, but also important to look into. Okay, so what about arbitrage? Um, so arbitrage exists naturally among a lot of taxes, a lot of exchanges, uh, not only within the blockchain, uh, but also between the blockchain and centralized exchanges or across blockchains nowadays with bridges. Um, so really just consider this as a subset of what exists out there. Um, we have tried to capture quite a few exchanges, uh, in particular uh, adding curve, um, which we had not captured for the for the sentry attacks, because it's quite complicated from a from a mathematical point of view. The the curve uh, formulas are not as simple as the constant product formulas of Uniswap and Sushi Swap. Um, but you can see here as well the monthly profit of arbitrage exceeded well uh, 10 million US dollar by August um, or September 2021. Very good. Uh, any questions about the numbers before we move on to transaction replay attacks? Maybe a, a general note, if there's any questions, also put them in chat so that we can uh, ask them and answer them at the end. Um, mm -hmm. So, on, I mean, I don't have questions on the individual numbers, uh, but I wonder regarding arbitrage, is there something that you can clearly identify as arbitrage because I, I remember there's some borderline cases uh, arbitrage at what risk uh, when do you consider it still as risk free or as uh, yeah uh, the opportunity that is taken by somebody with a certain appetite for risk. Mm, um, so there there are certain false positive uh, or I mean. I, I'm, I'm actually, I don't remember fully the false positive, false negatives um, that we could have in the, for the arbitrage heuristics. I would need to check the paper. Um, but there's certainly some possible inaccuracies that we have in, in our measurements. Um, no, I mean, not, I'm not talking about the measurement inaccuracies, just in terms of definition, right? I mean, if you look at a finance textbook, you say arbitrage is profit without risk. In practice, of course, every arbitrage has some risks. Mm except maybe if you take uh, atomic transactions like sandwich attacks. But once you do not look at sandwich attacks anymore, but at let's say conventional arbitrage, then what you define as arbitrage or not always depends on how much willingness to accept risk do you um, assume that the, the counterparties or the actors have. And so mm -hmm. I'm wondering whether, whether you have applied a criterion here or, or do you strictly say arbitrage is only if I get it risk-free? We we don't we don't consider the risk actually in our measurements um, because we I mean I wouldn't actually I mean how would we quantify the risk I mean okay there are because the the risk uh, I mean if if I understand if I understand correctly because the risk uh, of not extracting would mean that you your transaction will fail and that you pay some gas fee for a failed transaction. Whereas, yeah, that's one thing. That's of course the transaction cost in forms of gas in in terms of gas fee. But right. just think of arbitrage between two markets, right? That means you have, in principle, you have to execute 
in one transaction and in, in one atomic transaction uh, both trades yeah only then you can be risk-free but many of right. the arbitrage that's happening is not risk-free in this sense yeah you just carry out two transactions and uh, hope that both are executed or hope that both are executed at the price that you foresee and in practice the price may change on one or the other market in one or the other direction meaning that in the end the arbitrageur accepts some risk and 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 still carries out the trade oh i see i see now what you mean right we only consider those transactions that are atomic so okay um, good so that means yeah, yeah so essentially it's like sandwich attacks so everything you are looking at is atomic exactly yeah okay, oh thanks. well the, the sandwich attacks not necessarily uh i think in the sandwich attacks um we i think we do catch for, for arbitrage i'm pretty certain we capture only atomic ones um but for the sandwich attacks, I think we also looked at cases where the, the adversary did not include the victim transaction. Um, that's common practice nowadays. That's true. Right? And nowadays, the so-called, uh, especially with the front-running services, you take a victim and you package it in a bundle and then everything's atomic. Um, but I think we looked in for the sandwich attacks. I would need to look it up again, but I'm pretty certain we looked at... Um, and non-atomic cases as well. Just for the arbitrage, as far as I remember, we looked only at the atomic uh, arbitrage cases because there's no third party involved um, except if there's back running. Um, yeah, well, and there's two marketplaces. If they're not synchronized, then yeah, they can just be arbitrary other transactions on these markets changing changing prices. I mean, if, if two markets are not synchronized and then and we want to arbitrage them out, it, it would not be smart from an arbitrager to, to create two transactions, right? Because we can make them atomic. Um, if you can, yes, then it's fine. But sometimes you can't, yeah? If you have incompatible blockchains or let's say oh, a right, fiat right. market and the blockchain market. Absolutely, right. We only, looked at, uh, we only looked at Ethereum and only at these exchanges. And for all of them, you can make uh, atomic arbitrage. So there's I see. no- Thank you very much. I mean, for the adversary, it would be not rational to not do it. Um, but it could be that there are some non-rational <laughs> adversaries, right? <laughs> yeah, good point. Um, so I mentioned to you, we have three blockchain extractable value sources, but there's a fourth one. Um, and that one is maybe overlapping with the previous ones. Um, so therefore I present it more in like in a, in a separate note. Um, and this is a generalized front running approach. Uh, it's like a copycat or in network security terms, you would call it a replay um, of, a, of a packet. Um, so you observe a transaction on the network layer, on the peer-to-peer -peer layer, for instance, then you replace certain data within that transaction, you sign it with your own private key and you broadcast the copy. Obviously with the intent to become mined before the victim that you're, be, that you're uh, replaying here. So we again looked at the 32 months time frame, and we found that with, with a very simple and naive uh, algorithm that I will show you in the next slide, we were able to extract 35 million US dollars in profit. Obviously, this is the theoretical value. We unfortunately didn't extract that value. But if you were a miner, and if you can do that, uh, if, if, you, if you mine every block, that's the maximum value that we think that you could have extracted uh, from the past chain. That accounts for about 0.02% of the transactions. So not many transactions are vulnerable, but enough. And the real-time algorithm that we present is, is really super naive. It's, it's a string and replace algorithm. And therefore it naturally executes in real time, 0.2 seconds uh, on average. Um, I will show you the algorithm here on the left side. Um, it's really simple. You take a victim transaction as input, TV. You um, uh, you change the sender of the transaction to uh, uh, to the send to the address of A. You change the value to the to the address of the of the uh, victim transaction, and the input uh, of of your copycat transaction will be the um, the input data of the victim transaction. But you replace wherever you find the the victim sender address with the adversary address. So. In short, you just replace the victim address with the adversary address wherever you can in the victim transaction. So very simple algorithm, right? Uh, literally three lines here. Um, and what's beautiful is we found here that in, in October 
2020, we captured uh, the BZX attack. Uh, this was one of the earlier uh, price oracle manipulations attack that could have been caught by, by such a naive replay mechanism. Um, we also show here the number of replayable transactions over time. Um, I mean, for me, as a security researcher, it's this is super exciting because I see how we can maybe develop like intrusion prevention systems or um, by by white hat hacking in an automated manner DeFi attacks. Right? Um, that's that's something that we are working at the moment, and the the replay attack or this, these naive replay attacks are really the base for for such developments. Um, and um, yeah, I'm really looking forward to intrusion prevention or firewalls for DeFi where um, an attacker has to make sure that not only do they execute the attack profitably, but they also evade um, like um, such generalized front running algorithms that try to prevent attacks. Very good. Um, so um, th this paper or um, this paper was published at SMP and you might ask, well, how is the security relevant? Um, Sandwich attacks are uh, like our uh, malicious activity, uh, as you as you probably already guessed. But um, BV as a whole um, is more malicious than than it might appear. So what can happen is that uh, a miner is incentivized to fork the chain because there are certain blockchain extractable value opportunities on chain. So what we found is. If you have a 10% miner, and that's just one number, right? You can obviously parameterize this however you want. If a 10% miner sees um, an, an MEV opportunity or BEV opportunity with 4x the average block reward, then this miner is incentivized to fork the chain. Right? So in, in all the blockchain security studies that we have done, that the community has done, we, we should factor in such, uh, such bribes or such incentive, new incentive uh, sources uh, that come about. Right? I believe such such um, irregular uh, block reward opportunities are much more rare on on blockchains such as Bitcoin, where there's less activity on the on the DeFi side. Um, but in Ethereum or DeFi enabled blockchains, um, the the block reward, including BEV is significantly volatile right? and hence, especially if we have uh, huge attacks coming about um, the miners, the rational thing for miners would literally be to fork and to create long, long forks. I mean, we have seen um, in, in our data set, we have seen MEV or uh, BEV opportunities 600 times the average block reward, right? which really incentivizes miners to, to fork the chain. Uh, so far, we haven't seen this much. Um, there's at least not much uh, empirical evidence. But um, I think it's just a question of time until miners have uh, have optimal BEV forking uh, software in their clients. Yeah. Very good. Um, so this is just a yeah a histogram kind of of the BEV over the block rewards, like uh, that you can see a bit the distribution. Um, and uh, yeah, there are quite a few, um, there are quite a few BV opportunities that incentivize miners to really fork the chain. Right? Uh, we don't know yet how this will evolve for proof of stake. Um, there may be some changes, there may be no changes, um, but this is at least uh, valid for proof of work. Um, so obviously, these, these things might change after, for instance, the merge in, in Ethereum. All right, so the. Um, I'm not sure how much time I still have, but the um, the next note will be on front running as a service. Couple um, minutes. Oh, two minutes. Okay, then I have to be a bit quicker. Um, so I mentioned at the beginning that, that everything is happening in the peer-to-peer -peer network with a set of miners, but nowadays what we see is the emergence of so-called uh, front running as a service that then do this through a centralized server. So the server peers with miners. And there's a still a peer-to-peer -peer network, but this is kind of like in parallel, right? So you have two parallel streams of how to communicate with a miner as a, as a trader or as a user. And um, what these traders can do is they can package a transaction, for example, send this attack here in a so-called bundle that's then sent to the miners and the miners are being paid a bribe to accept this. So there's a local 
auction happening on the server side. Um, and uh, the peer-to-peer -peer layer it, information may still be added, but uh, it may, may, may also not be prioritized uh, as much. So, so there are two, what I, the, the high level message I would like to, to convey is that there are two auction games going on nowadays. Uh, if you wanna uh, submit a transaction to miners, there's a first pry all pay auction on the peer-to-peer -peer layer, all pay because if your transaction fails, you pay, right? If you in the, and in the front running as a service network, if a transaction fails, you don't pay. So that's a fundamental difference here. The uh, FAS auction is a first price sealed bid auction. Sealed bid meaning you don't know why your transaction failed uh, or you at least you don't know the highest bid. Well, you do know the highest bid after the block was mined, but you do not know the second highest bid, for instance. You don't know the distribution of bids that are happening uh, in these uh, front running as a service uh, um, operators. So we looked at, uh, we, we tried to, quantify um, how many, we try to quantify how many um, traders would prefer to use front running as a service or the P2P network. And we found that if 90% of the miners adopt like uh, the centralized FAS um, services, then still 50% of the arbitrage transaction would still remain in the P2P network. So these are just like, estimations from our side. Uh, we did some local simulations as well. Um, we don't know, that this is something I'm, I'm actually missing a bit in, in, in related work still. Um, we don't know the implications on the network layer of these front running as a service providers. Um, I think there's still a lot that can be learned um, uh, through these. And luckily some of this data is open so we can see at least the winning bits, which is, which is great, a great resource for us research. Okay, I, will, I think I will skip this to just leave some time also for more questions, but overall they're good and bad things with these front running as a service providers. Uh, I think the, the main bad aspect is the centralization. Uh, so you're empowering a in, in new intermediary, which is not the goal of decentralized systems. Um, and uh, it, it may reduce the P2P network congestion, but we don't know by how much. And we also don't know whether it reduces blockchain transaction fees as a whole. There's not enough evidence to show that. Um, so yeah, it's still there are a lot of open questions here, which is great for us. Okay. Um, that, I, I don't want to talk only about attacks, so there are also ways to <laughs> mitigate BEV. Um, uh, there are a variety of techniques uh, like fair ordering on the blockchain layers. This is really promising. Um, uh, maybe we can even develop dApps to be more uh, BV friendly. So for example, if you, as a trader, you open an arbitrage opportunity, why not take it just yourself? Why leave it to others? Right? Um, so I think we can design BV mindful dApps uh, to just fix BV at least on a on single blockchain. But that might not fix cross-chain BEV, and it, this is probably very tricky to, to fix as well. So there's still a lot of going uh, ongoing work to, to really mitigate BEV. Thank you very much. And this is just here an overview of the values extracted of the different techniques for you to, to look at. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, Arthur, thank you very much. I think this was exactly the right thing to set the scene. And we also see not only the security implications, but also uh, the measurement aspects. Yeah, how do you get to all these values? And I think, uh, um, yeah, also the audience, you see that we are dealing with a very, very um, educated audience in this area when you just look at this set of questions. Um, maybe we should um, ask Michael's second question first, because it may uh, set the frame also for other answers. Because he asked how many of the opportunities for generalized front running that you identified were actually exploited by others. So the more general question is, do your measurements only look at exploited opportunities also or opportunities in general? Um, extracted. We, we looked at uh, not the, uh, we didn't look at the uh, extractable uh, or potentially extractable, we looked at the extracted uh, value, right? Right, so I guess that answers Victor's first question where he asked whether you retrospectively simulate the state changes to test whether your copycat transactions would have yielded profit. Victor, is that? 
Um, yes. No, we, we we actually we did so for the it's it's true actually for the um, for the for the transaction replay. Sorry, <laughs> for the transaction replay, it's different. Right here in the figure, okay. you can see this is the potentially extractable value um, that we measured. Uh, while for the three others, it's the extracted value. Right. I see. It's a good point. Um, so for we didn't we didn't see it so in the past at least in the like past what um, let's say two two years two years ago to one year ago roughly we saw very little generalized front running activity but this picked up very quickly then uh, nowadays we do see uh, we do see naive replay transactions being mined through flashbots or these front running as a service providers. Yep. All right. So since you looked at extracted values, that uh, opens up uh, Bernhard's very first question, where he asked uh, whether you also check where the money went. Um, we did not. Um, we're currently writing a, a mixer paper where we're looking whether and to what degree BV extractors are using mixers, uh, but that's all I've, I've looked at so far. Yeah. Okay, then Ayosha has a uh, facts question. Um, is the front running as a service, a centralized service, or is it operated on a smart contract basis? Mm. It's a server. It's a centralized server. That's that's okay. the bad thing about it. So it, he, it, he has, it, the server has pr privileged information anyways and can, yeah. I, I asked these providers also, I asked them, what is your terms of service? What is your privacy policy? They don't reply. Like, okay. <laughs> and where are they based? Is there anything known about them? Um, I think the Caribbean, but uh, I mean, most people are in the US, but uh, I guess legally in the Caribbean. Yeah. yeah. Um, Malte has a question uh, on sandwich attacks. Does curve change the mass dynamics for sandwich attacks? I noticed it wasn't shown in the results figure. Absolutely. Uh, it's it's quite more complicated because it doesn't uh, use a simple AMM formula. So that's why we, we didn't capture it. Yeah. Okay, curve is a different uh, way of doing yeah, it's, it's a, um, I mean, it's a, at least the initial version of Curve was uh, aimed for stable, stable pairs, like, I mean, packed assets, like which have the same price to minimize the slippage. And there the state, the AMM formula, the, the constant product AMM formula is not ideal uh, for such assets. Um, yeah. So it's a constant function, but not a constant product market maker, right? Um, it's, it's not a constant product market maker, yeah. um, the, the Curve formula. All right, uh, I think Michael, there were two questions of yours that we haven't uh, touched yet. Um, how many of the opportunities for general, no, sorry, this was the one I already read out. Uh, first one, how was the generalized replayer funded? I guess that would make a difference. So again, on replays. Mm. What do you mean by funded? Like the- Maybe Michael, chime in yourself and then you can also ask uh, the second question. It was yourself. answered because you only looked at the actual extracted value so because you you changed uh, the sender of the transaction to see if you can extract any value, right? We changed the sender to us, yes. Yeah, right. exactly. And then it, the, the, the transaction, the successful transaction might depend on you having a certain asset. Sure. And yep. uh, that is ex exactly the question. Did you fund or simulate your account to be funded with certain assets? Absolutely. Um, we, we funded it with Ether. Uh, okay, I, so thank you. I, I get now your question. So we had a, I think we funded it with quite a lot of ether, um, but this is all simulated locally anyways, right? In our emulator or fake, fake EVM fork. Um, but to my surprise, because this will probably be your next question, we didn't actually need much ether to execute those replay attacks. Um, so most of them use 10, less than 10 ether. Um, which is trivial uh, for with, with flash loans, for instance, right? Um, and even if you need more, then you can use flash loans. Yeah. Okay. All right, Michael, that's the last question of yours that hasn't been answered. Do you want to answer, ask it yourself? Sure. Um, I was asking myself, uh, how many front running transactions did follow the expected transaction ordering you talked about in the beginning, like mm -hmm. uh, the gas price and the maximum gas uh, you're willing to pay? uh yeah of the whole front running transaction set so are most of the front runners submitting their transactions probably to miners directly or are they going through the peer-to-peer -peer network um 
I would say like nowadays, um, I mean, we're, we're, we're building uh, like uh, Grafana dashboards and so on to make this a bit more pretty in real time um, with, with spinals. That's why I mentioned the attack earlier this morning. Um, I think it's about half, half, I would guess, like roughly at the moment. Um, I mean, we've seen a 50 ether naive opportunity going through flashbots two days ago. Um, so this was uh, one of the larger larger ones. Um, but um, the, yeah, roughly, right? Um, so this is not looking at liquidation, arbitrage, and sandwich, just at the replay. Yeah. yeah. All right. Thank you all for the questions. Thank you, Arthur, for the precise answers and for your talk in general. And I think we move on uh, to the other papers in the section and the session, sorry, and uh, Friedhelm, you are the chair. Arthur. Right. I'll, I'll take over. Um, so thanks again, Arthur. Um, we'll, we'll move on to the next talk. We're slightly delayed, but uh, I think we'll be fine. Um, so uh, the first contributed talk is titled, um, how much is the fork fast probability and profitability calculation during temporary forks and will be presented by Ayosha Yudmaya. Ayosha, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, great. Can I try to share screen and can you see the screen as well? Yes. Great. Um, yeah, thanks for the introduction. I'm talking about our paper, how much is the fork, fast probability and profitability calculations during temporary forks. Uh, my name is Ayush Lutma. I did this work with my dear fellow co-authors, Nicholas Schlifter, Philipp Schindler, and Edgar Weiper. Um, if you want to read in the paper, uh, this is the QR code pointing you to the to the ePrint and in the paper as well as on the ePrint site, you also find a link to the GitHub repository with all the codes and artifacts. Yeah, it was a collaboration between the research group Security and Privacy and SPA Research. Um, and yeah, let's dig into it. So what's the motivation? Um, in this excellent previous talk from Atosh OS, we already uh, uh, saw a lot that motivates this talk. Um, and basically estimating the probability and profitability of a tax is very important in cryptocurrencies uh, for the security of cryptocurrencies. And a lot of previous modeling approaches um, kind of some, yeah, uh, think that is not ideal. So some of them from the very early on ones, they focus on infinite attack durations. Some of them do not account for already contributed blocks. And a lot of them implicitly assume honest victims, which means that they assume victims or, or like the, the altruistic honest actors, which stop continuing their chain as soon as the attacker's chain gets one block ahead. So they are basically then all happily switch over and everything is fine, regardless of all the blocks they have contributed previously to this now stale chain. And um, some of these approaches, because they are trying to find optimal strategies or new optimal strategies, they are kind of computationally heavy. So what is the contribution of this paper? Basically, we're, we're searching for a simple yet practical model to quickly estimate the success probability and profitability for mining the next block during some during finite attack. So what basically the question is, I'm a miner, there is a fork, there are two chains, uh, where should I put my hash rate on and get a decision as fast as possible? And thereby we will also account for already contributed blocks, victims that do not give up that easily, and potential additional extractable value, blockchain extractable value, mining extractable value, opportunities or bribes. Um, and it should be fast to compute. So uh, to give you some intuition, of course, it's very difficult to compute pair different modeling approaches because the models are different. Um, but um, if you take, for example, the very famous MDP, the markup decision process by the previous lecturer, Arthur Gervais, which is very prominently and very versatile and uh, used in a couple of papers, um, it's designed to produce optimal solutions and there one takes a lot of parameters, like for example, uh, the stale block rate, which we do not consider in, in, this, in this paper, um, but it runs um, on my desktop computer. It takes about a couple of minutes or two to three minutes. I have to admit, I've not tried optimizing it, 
um, despite playing a little with the parameters, but this is roughly the time it takes on my desktop computer. Whereas the computations uh, in the notebooks, you can check out there for reasonably sized parameters, they are running in milliseconds, like forks of a couple of dozen blocks. Um, so yeah, this, this is what it's all about. And at the end, we're quickly looking over some simulations of different forking events, um, including bribes. So since obviously measuring and modeling security of such prevalent cryptocurrencies, mostly based on proof of work, there is a lot of related work. I only skip briefly uh, over these. So there are Markov chains, which we also use in this paper. But in the past, they have mostly been used to model selfish mining, which is a little different scenario. Um, then there are Markov decision process, um, which were uh, used to find optimal strategies also the uh, very famous MDP by Chavez, uh, which was later reused also for this figure we saw in the previous talk um, about the four times the block reward that is required to incentivize a 10% uh, miner to kind of fork a block. Um, and there is the work starting from Rosenfeld et al. and Leo and Katz, um, which uh, try, is closest to this work and upon which we base uh, our work here. And of course, there's a lot of orthogonal work on how to identify the MF or blockchain extractable values opportunities, um, which are not the focus of this talk. So basically, this talk is about, okay, if I find something, um, do I start or do I we to try to approach the question whether or not to join an initiate of blockchain fork to hunt the missed uh, MEF opportunity or bribe, which could be argued is essentially the same thing. So what's the model? Uh, in our model, we differentiate between roles, types, and sites of players. So this uh, differentiation is a little bit verbose, more verbose than it's actually needed in the paper, I have to admit, but it sometimes helps to be more explicit and verbose also when discussing and crossing out things you're not looking at. Um, so what are the roles? So roles of a player, um, describe their capabilities. So of course, there are miners which have voting power in the, in the network, they have hash rate, and there are users which do not have this voting power, this hash rate. So this, of course, separates them regarding the capabilities of what they can do. So if a user is a victim, the user cannot start mining on his preferred chain, he has to bribe somebody else to do this. So for this paper, this analysis, we mostly focus on the perspective of a miner. So we see everything from the perspective of a miner M with some hash rate PM, or you can think of it as power. So this is the perspective we're taking. Um, regarding types, um, uh, so the types in our model, they distinguish the general strategic behavior of a player. And we differentiate between altruistic players, Byzantine players, and rational players. Altruistic players, they follow the protocol no matter what. And uh, in previous modeling attempts, all the victims have been assumed to be altruistic as well. So most of the other ones. Um, then there are Pusantine players, they act destructive, so they carry out an attack no matter what, and they're the rational players or short-term economically rational players, which generally follow the protocol as long as there is a more profitable option. And this is exactly the category we're most interested in, and therefore it can be split up during an attack or during a potential forking scenario into three other groups, which are the extractors or the exploiters, and they seek to exploit this additional value extraction opportunity. So they found one to try to exploit it. Therefore, they are willing or looking into a forking scenario. Then there are the victims. The victims are the ones that would lose funds if the attacks are successful. So previously, they have mostly been modeled as altruistic. Um, and then there are the indifferent ones. Uh, and the indifferent ones, they are rational, so they neither profit nor lose in this particular attack, but they're um, basically, yeah, they can change their opinion uh, if something changes and they can then be take, taking side of the extractors or the victims. So, but as long as there is nothing that influences their decision, they can also be modeled as altruistic. So, uh, so, so good. So, uh, first of all, I want to start with a quick recap um, on the papers of Rosenfeld and Leo and Katz, 
on which this model is based on. So uh, in, the, in these early works, um, the success probability from the perspective of minor, if a fork, initiated fork is successful, was calculated by the hash rate on the fork chain. So everybody working on the fork chain divided by the hash rate of everybody working on the main chain um, to the power of Z plus one, where Z is the number of blocks the, the, the tech chain is currently behind. So this gives you the success probability um, from the perspective um, of, of a fork initiated by these malicious miners, if and if uh, Z is larger than zero and the overall hash rate of the attackers is below 50 percent. This will this will give you then the success probability of this attack to work. How could this even work in a scenario where we look at infinite attacks? Uh, how could this even work that they win if the attack rate of all the attacks is below 50 percent because of the implicit assumption that uh, all the others join the attack chain as soon as it takes the lead. So they will happily join the attack chain as soon as it's one block ahead, they will join and therefore there's a probability to get ahead at some point and you can win even with less than 50%. So um, in our notation, um, this would uh, depict as follows. So the probability for a successful attack uh, from the perspective of minor M um, to join the attack. So if the miner M joins the attack, he mines together side by side with the miners uh, that are Byzantine and the miners that want to extract uh, uh, some, some value opportunity. And he works against the miners that are altruistic, that are the victims of these attacks, and maybe the miners that are indifferent um, or don't know about what's going on. And uh, vice versa, the success probability if uh, the miner M decides to abstain from the attack, so he decides to continue working on the main chain, on the canonical chain, um, then he joins sides with the altruistic miners, the victims, and the indifferent ones, and uh, mines against the Byzantine and the extractors. And this is the success probability then um, of, for, of the attack when the miner decides to abstain. So I'm not I'm not joining the attack, I'm mining against it. What is the probability that the attack still succeeds? Yeah, and with these probabilities, you can also um, look at the expected profit for the next block normalized, uh, of an next block if the block rewards are normalized. So what would be the expected profit uh, on, on, the, on the fork chain. Um, so the expected profit to, call, to get the expected normalized profit. Of course, the condition that has to be fulfilled is actually the fork has to win. So the probability is required that the fork uh, chain wins. This is the first condition. And if the fork chain wins, I am as a miner M still have to mine the next block. So I have to mine the next block competing on my fork chain with the miners that are Byzantine and extracting um, and to get against those miners, so all the hash rates is working on the fork, I still have to win the block there. And if I win a block, I get the normalist block reward plus potentially an additional value opportunity like a bribe or uh, some minor extractable value opportunity. What's the expected profit on the main chain? Basically exactly the same. Um, if I would mine on the main chain as a miner M, um, but this time I'm of course um, working working for a block on the main chain against the altruistic miners, the um, the victim miners, and the different miners. And of course, to get my rewards on the main chain, this is the probability that actually the attack fails. Uh, <clears throat> yeah. So if this holds true, then I get my expected profit on the main chain when I uh, decide to stay on the main chain. So um, how to add now already contributed blocks? So far, this was all basically uh, old news. Um, how to add already contributed blocks to this, to this decision? So basically, simply just take the number of already contributed blocks to the fork. And this is what I would get, plus some additional bribe or uh, extractable value opportunity. And I get this only with the probability that the fork actually wins. And this is my basically value I get from number of blocks that I have already contributed. Of course, I have to do the same thing for uh, the blocks I've contributed to the main chain, but 
Um, uh, but I, of course, get only the block I contributed to the main chain if the main chain rules. So I have to do this because there might be scenarios where miners contributed blocks to both chains. Maybe they contributed a block to the main chain, then decided to switch uh, because they haven't basically um, noticed the other fork. So uh, I have to account for also these types of situations. Um, now let's uh, look at some figures. Um, so here you see on the x-axis the different pot uh, pro potential probabilities of a minor M. And on the y-axis, you see the expected profit for the next block normalized to one. And first of all, let's look at the dashed line, the dashed blue line here. This would be standard mining without any attacks going on. Everybody is honest. So this line here starts from zero and basically it goes up and it's directly proportional to the hash rate of the miner. So if I'm a 30% miner, there are no attacks going on. Um, my expected reward is exactly 30%. So nothing new so far. Um, now, what happens if there is an attack? So if there is an attack that is likely not going to succeed, so there's a Byzantine miner that's attacking no matter what, and he has 25% of the hash rate, then actually my expected profit on the main chain as an honest miner is a little bit, is a little bit higher because um, there is less hash rate mining on the main chain. So I'm more likely to actually get a block on the main chain. Um, and the attack is, uh, of course, could succeed, but um, probably does not succeed. So then my expected profit, of course, at least compared to the, to the profit of pure honest mining is a little bit higher even. So um, let's compare this to the scenario where uh, there is this Byzantine miner uh, with a hash rate of 25%. And now I'm as a miner M, I'm deciding to join this miner. So what would be my profit on the attack chain then? And you see here at that point um, with that hash rate, I'm surpassing my expected profit on the main chain. And of course, if we both, if I have 25% and we're both basically um, above the, the 50%, then basically we share everything between us. Um, now, what if there are already mined blocks? So if it happened to be that I already mined the block on the main chain and on the attack chain, of course, this block here is kind of sunk profit. And I start my expected profit here at one because nobody, I will get a block reward of one no matter what, because I have a block on both chains, kind of. So um, this initial um, kind of plots show already some, some interesting artifacts of uh, infinite attacks. Um, because if we recap and zoom in on this standard comparison between honest mining, so the blue line is standard honest mining, um, no attacks going on, and compare this to a um, single attacker. So in this case, the miner M is the only attacker, and he uh, wants to know his probability in case he is one block behind, just, so just one block behind. Um, there is this point here at uh, about 38% of the hash rate, where suddenly uh, he would get a little bit more expected profit for um, trying to go through an attack, an infinitely running attack um, um, that exceeds his hash rate. So at that point, the expected profit exceeds his hash rate. And this is exactly as we have in the paper at one divided by phi squared, you have phi is the golden ratio. And this is kind of, kind of an artifact of these infinite attack two ratios. Um, but of course, in practice, attacks, uh, hardly any attack runs infinitely long. So the question is, um, what about more realistic attack scenarios where the attack is actually finite? So to approach this and have a, 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 a quick model to calculate probabilities in such a scenario, we decided to use a finite Markov chain. And um, if we now say, okay, we, at, we set the start point of this Markov chain to the current basically uh, parameter set. So if we're saying uh, we are one block behind, we would be, we will start out in state S minus one. And now um, as in other examples, the Byzantine miners and the evil miners um, try to basically um, win this chain race and every time they find a the block, they reduce or basically increase the state number. 
um, with the, of course, with the goal to get to the longest chain. And every time, every time the victims and the altruistic miners uh, and the, or in a different, in different miner finds a block, they increase this gap, of course. Now, the question is how far to go in each direction. And this is parameterized by this parameter K here. So K over left arrow basically specifies um, the, 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 the blocks I'm willing um, to continue this attack um, or, or the point at which I'm certainly giving up this race. Whereas in the other direction, this is the parameter K over right arrow specifies where uh, the others uh, where the others will certainly give up. And what changes now is um, as soon as the Byzantine miners and the Evo miners get one block ahead, so they're in state S1, suddenly they basically getting help from the altruistic miners, which follow the protocol and therefore might extend the longest chain, and the indifferent miners. But the victims, of course, they uh, keep on trying to mine against this chain because they have a lot to lose. Um, and so they keep on basically mining against this chain until this uh, clear win state. And since it's a finite Markov chain, you can calculate pretty easily the probabilities uh, of all these states. And if you sum up the probabilities of all these states here after a certain number of blocks or after a certain number of steps, um, you get the probability to land on in this half here of the chain. Um, and be on the winning side after a certain number of blocks. And this is what we consider a win, or a clear win if you reach this state. Um, what you might have noticed sorry. now is that, yes? Sorry to interrupt, um, but um, please come to an end. We're kind of running out yes. of time. Uh, thanks. Um, so we quickly compared this with uh, the infinite ones and see that we basically converge to the infinite case uh, given some, um, a higher number of blocks. And now what we wanted to ask, of course, is uh, what's the minimum bribe or the minimum extractable value that the, the fork, um, that the fork, the, ex the expected profit on the fork is higher than on the main chain because this is exactly the critical question. And if we now, um, first of all, compare the classic infinite attack case uh, where I'm one block behind. So this would be the classic infinite attack one block behind. Um, and uh, the color indicates the normalized number of normalized block rewards. So here at the 10% hash rate in the classic scenario, it would require around eight normalized block rewards or nine or something like that, uh, which is a little higher than what, um, or what the MDP of um, Chavez et al provided. So this would, in this case, in the classic case, would be around 15, where it's a, a, a four, four times the normalized block reward. Um, but if we look at the probabilities from our finite attacks, they are slightly, <clears throat> slightly worse because we're now not going infinitely long, but comparable. If we now look at victims that not give up so easily as well, you see it gets again a little worse because of course now we have a victim with 25% hash rate that continues basically three blocks, even three blocks after our chain is in the lead to mine against it. So it still gets a little worse. And if you also consider blocks that you already contributed to the main chain, in this case, the attack contributed already one block to the main chain, which you would lose in this case, it's getting again a little bit worse. So this um, may be, is an additional reason why miners may be reluctant to, to ridiculously uh, exploit meth opportunities, um, so without any fear, but it's not a big safety margin. Um, so how could this be reduced? We looked at some uh, possibility for effort-related compensation. So in short, basically, um, if you compensate a miner if you can credibly promise a compensation for the miner to say, if you contribute to my, to my attack uh, and mine a block, uh, you get this block reward no matter what, even if the attack does not succeed, then the situation changes uh, quite substantially because then you don't need any, any more any additional bribes. So interestingly, you need bribes or additional value um, to to incentivize miners to join your attack then if the overall attacker hash rate that's 
also on the deck is very is very high. So if your individual mining hash rate, hash rate is is uh, lower, but the other attackers on the attack chain is very high, uh, so you have a lot of miners mining on the attack chain, you need again bribes, but in the other case you don't. And uh, this also holds true for forks that are a little bit longer, here in this case six blocks. Um, so this is a, should be an interesting approach. Yeah, basically this was it. Of course, there are a couple of limitations and directions for future work. So for example, what we've not looked in uh, is pricing in these compensations, um, but they should be linear in the number of blocks. And what we of course also not looked into are the consequences of such attacks on exchange rate and the markets in general. Yeah, and with that, I want to conclude and uh, see if there are any questions. Thank you, Ayosha, for the very interesting talk. Um, we have to go a bit quick. Um, there are two questions from Arthur in the chat. Um, I'm the first searching for the something. Yes. So, so the first question is, um, do you assume a constant um, proof of work difficulty in your analysis? Yes, of course. Uh, of course, uh, we have to assume constant work, uh, constant proof of work difficulty. Otherwise, it's getting very tricky, yes. OK, and then the, the second question um, is, uh, when do you plan to provide an optimal BV mining get client or API to miners? <laughs> Yeah, uh, uh, this is a good question. Uh, I heard there were a lot of, of um, discussion in the community because actually there is MEV GET and uh, there was a lot of discussion about the feature in MEV GET that wanted to basically allow forking in the backward direction. So actually forking blocks that have already been mined and sharing the rewards of MEV opportunities. Uh, yeah. Uh, by bribing other miners also to join the attack. And this was not like um, received that well. And I can imagine why, because this would make the whole situation a lot more unstable. But the question actually to me is when this is gonna happen, because it's that, really gonna happen eventually. The idea is out there now, so. <laughs> the, the idea is out there now, so it will happen at some point. And uh, it looks like it could be very profitable uh, or it collapses, I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, th thank you very much again. Um, let's thank the speaker virtually <laughs> with a clap. Uh, and um, with that, uh, I, I want to hand over to Malte for a very, very brief uh, announcements and discussions, and then we'll have a break. Thank you. Yeah, I don't think we have any official announcement or anything like that. I would suggest that anyone who wants to take a break, quick break can take a quick break. If you want to hang around, um, maybe just say hi, introduce yourself. It's always nice in these small workshops to get to know um, what the other people are working on, who is who. Um, especially if you just started in this space, you'll notice that you often meet the same people again and again at conferences. So it's it's really nice to to know. like the audience and um, just your fellow um, colleagues at other places so um, maybe i just make a start if like if you want to take a break go take a break get some water um, otherwise hang hang around um, i can just give a quick intro for myself i'm Altimusa. i recently finished a phd i did a lot of work in the past on cryptocurrency uh, privacy um, and um, now I chain analysis and generally interested still like in privacy, but also a lot more on Ethereum um, and DeFi ecosystems and things like that. Um, yeah, if someone else wants to say hi, please feel free to do so. Oh, sorry. Hi, Malta. But this is a very different thing. Just for the logistics issue, may I confirm with the organizer, maybe Sebastian, if you can tell us, is this going to be active for the second session as well? Or do we move on to the other Zoom link? Uh, it's it's supposed to be the same Zoom link. All right, so we can this hang around. Same, yeah, yeah, you can hang around on this one. I'll just uh, confirm, but uh, I did look at it earlier. All right, thank you. No problem. Uh, yeah, so that's yeah. No, no, and um, 
and you will also see that basically um, uh, Romain, who's on the call, so he, he's going to be uh, replacing me. He's going to be the volunteer if you have any question. Uh, and I'm just looking, yes, it's the same um, Zoom account, uh, Zoom link for uh, the second piece of the session. So you guys can see on this one. Perfect. Hi. Thanks a lot. Hi, everyone. Right. So, yeah, I'll take over from Morton. I'm from NTU Singapore. My name is Saurav. I was asking about the logistics because I'm going to chair the next session. And I see our invited talk keynote speaker, Chahua. Hi. Thanks for joining. I hi. also, hi. So I'm assuming you are from UCL now. Are you in London? Yes, I am. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> sorry. I'm almost still on baby duty. I'll be there for a Sure, no problem. Take your time. Does anyone wants to say hi? Maybe our next set of technical talks. I see a lot of you actually, Robert, Marcel. Sure, I can say hi. So uh, I'm Robert Mood. I'm a PhD student at TU Berlin. I've seen some faces here before, but I, I'm but I also think we've never seen in person. Um, we're feeling with these remote conferences. Um, Marcel is a student at HU Berlin, so Humboldt University, I'm at TU Berlin. And we have our third author, it's Martin Florian. I also should say hello from Martin Florian to uh, Rainer Böhme. I think they know each other, but he couldn't come today. Thank you very much and uh, say my regards back to him. I will. And... Um, Who is presenting today, Robert? You or Marcel? It's Marcel. It's uh, actually Marcel's uh, project for his master's um, thesis, or his. We, we have something we have to work on a project before we can write the master's thesis. So he's pre presenting his uh, results on his project. Therefore, ah, oh, there he is back. So maybe he can continue with his introduction. Perfect timing, Marcel. Uh, yeah, hi. <laughs> I, I heard my name. I don't know how much you you have uh, said already, but but I'm a student at HU. I'm about to finish my master's degree. Currently writing on my thesis, and yeah, we published or I published my my first paper. So I'm curious about the space and um, maybe continue in that direction. I find it quite interesting. Awesome. Um, hey, hey everyone, this is Rakesh. Uh, I'm not presenting, but um, I am just listening to the talk uh, about one of the years by CP members. Thanks, Sora, for inviting me for, for this PC. Um, I'm from IIT Kanpur, and uh, can you hear me clearly? We can hear you. Yes. Uh, okay. So um, I only have Technology degree in medical science, so I do more uh, behavioral analysis of things. Uh, um, so this is where uh, this is where the blockchain uh, investing and uh, we really get involved with uh, that sort of activity within people can watch similar to what um, but uh, but not uh, not involved with any any. any Company, but more from the research side uh, from IIT Kanpur. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, awesome to have everyone. I think we have two or three minutes left before the next session. So if anyone still wants to go, please feel free to jump in. Anyway, let's start with the second session for our crypto asset analytics workshop. It's my pleasure to invite Chahua to join us today for a talk on their recent work. And it's a really good opportunity for us to hear from both sides of the story. We have heard a lot about the crypto analytics space in terms of Arthur's talk, as well as the last paper that was presented, more on the analytics side, more on the theoretical side. Chao is uh, amazingly 
may be placed in this domain coming from a management background working in blockchain economics in insurance as well as in finance domain uh, Jehu currently is affiliated jointly with UCL as well as EPFL if I'm not wrong as well as as a data analyst in uh, in the industry so uh, Jehu it's uh, your space I know you from the SNP work which was more of the security side is the next work which was way back uh, you have worked across security and DeFi space quite comfortably it's your stage thanks a lot for joining thank you thank you very much thanks for the intro uh okay great so let me get started no more baby noise anymore <laughs> <laughs> cool okay so yeah, so uh, today I um, do want to present my most recent work. Uh, it is the systematization of knowledge on yield aggregators in DeFi. I think this is a very interesting uh, a DeFi uh, type of DeFi protocol because it does connect all sorts of other DeFi protocols, which we'll see in a bit. So um, before uh, jumping into what your aggregators actually are, um, just a quick definition. I'm, I'm sure that you all know, understand what DeFi is, but just to, just to recap, refresh your memory real quick. DeFi is basically a rule-based financial system that operates according to protocols composed of smart contracts on blockchain. So here uh, I kind of highlight protocols and rule base there and smart contracts they're actually more or less synonymous um as far as i see so basically it's like a financial uh services platform that uh, operates algorithmically so um here is uh kind of like an overview kind of landscape of uh DeFi applications if i may just to have a quick poll i know we don't uh, we have Okay, 15 attendees here. May I just uh, get a sense of um, of your guys' familiarity with those protocols? So if you could give me a thumbs up, um, if you know more than two logos on this uh, on the screen, just let me know. That would also be good for me to decide whether I should kind of go a bit deeper into a different kind of mechanics or not okay one two three four okay i guess half so i wouldn't i wouldn't bore you with uh with the fundamental basics but i will still uh explain a little bit kind of uh the give you a general overview of how each type of DeFi applications work um, for those who are not quite familiar with DeFi applications so um first and foremost we have uh, decentralized exchanges um, here I listed a few examples, Uniswap, Balancer, Curve, and Dodo. So decentralized exchanges, the way they work um, is um, those are all uh, automated market making uh, uh, protocols. Those are, those are uh, DEX uh, with, uh, with AMM protocols. So essentially uh, different from order book based uh, uh, exchanges, the way they work is that um, instead of matching a seller and, uh, and, and a buyer, a trader would actually trade against a pool, a liquidity pool, um, instead of a, a kind of trading counterparty. And the exchange rate between two assets uh, would be alg algorithmically determined uh, based on a a pre-programmed, a, a pre predetermined uh, bonding curve or conservation function, we call uh, and the most uh, simple or most fundamental bonding curve is the Uniswap uh, version 2 v2 uh, bonding curve, which is simply x times y uh, is equal to z. So basically uh, the product of the two quantities of a um, trading pair in a pool is always constant uh, when somebody trades. And then the second type of DeFi protocols uh, would be lending protocols. Here again, uh, some uh, examples we have MakerDAO, a Compound, and Ave. So with lending protocols, um, what uh, well, it's quite self-explanatory. You would have lenders and borrowers. So borrowers would deposit uh, some assets into lending protocols, and lenders, um, uh, sorry, 
lenders would deposit some assets into the lending protocol. Um, and those assets will simultaneously be also used as um, collateral. So um, in that case, you can also take a loan out from the lending protocol. And so in that sense, uh, to be a borrower, you have to be a depositor or, or, or lender in the first place. So those lending protocols, they are always uh, over collateralized, uh, used over collateralized um, lending. Um, and the third category, which will be the focus of this presentation, is the yield aggregators. Uh, so here I list some uh, kind of widely um, adopted, renowned uh, yield aggregators, such as Yearn Finance, Harvard Finance, uh, Pickle Finance, and also one of, and just one example of some emerging ones. Here I list Bank of Chain. Um, later on, I'll explain how yield aggregators uh, built upon all the other uh, DeFi building blocks, such as decentralized exchange and lending protocols, most importantly. And last but not least, I just want to give you a, uh, a quick overview also on some uh, DeFi insurance solutions, such as Next Mutual, Ether Risk, Insure. Uh, I think they are uh, important to mention, although they're not mandatory, but only optional, um, but because uh, yield farming is kind of like an investment activity on DeFi um, and to uh, insure uh, investors from uh, from financial loss. Some of the yield aggregators also adopt uh, insurance solutions just to give their users extra security. Okay. So now what exactly is a DeFi uh, yield aggregator? Well, a DeFi yield aggregator can be deemed as a decentralized fund manager, as far as I see, um, that uses smart contracts to determine some kind of investment strategies and also automatically execute those investment strategies. Uh, why would we use DeFi aggregators? Uh, sorry, why would we use DeFi yield aggregators instead of just investing ourselves? Well, this is uh, particularly relevant for networks with high gas fees, such as Ethereum, um, because uh, well, if you interact with yield generating protocols, especially if when uh, if those protocols are very complex, uh, using a computationally expensive smart contract, uh, I guess most of you would have the experience that the gas fee is very high. So by pooling the assets together, all you would need to do is just to deposit the assets into a DeFi aggregator smart contract, and then the smart contract um, would uh, collectively conduct some kind of uh, investment strategy such that the gas fee will be uh, uh, distributed among, uh, among all the users um, such that uh, you know, the, the, the cost will be um, more um, efficiently uh, spent. Um, so will, uh, where do those yields come from for, for DeFi aggregators? Well, here I list three sources of yield. First, we have borrowing demand. Uh, those are concerning lending protocols. Um, I list two types of tokens here, C token that's connected to compound. So when you deposit, um, deposit some crypto assets into the compound protocol, you will be returned with this deposit certificate um, in the form of C token. And similarly, uh, if you deposit some assets into Aave, it's another lending protocol, then you will also be returned with a deposit certificate in the form of a token. So uh, why would we say that there's certain types of yield that, that uh, uh, come from borrowing demand? Well, because when you deposit uh, crypto assets into lending protocols, they will accrue lending interest or some kind of deposit interest. Basically, it works like a bank. So you deposit some money into a, into, into a, a protocol. Um, the protocol will then uh, the asset can then be borrowed out. And the borrowers, when they uh, repay their loan, they would have to repay borrow interest. And this borrow interest is essentially uh, the ultimate uh, yield for the depositors. So that's, that's the uh, first type of yield. So basically the, the lending interest, and uh, which ultimately, again, comes from borrowing demand. And then the uh, second type, uh, is revenue sharing. 
here I listed some LP tokens. LP stands for uh, liquidity providers. Um, and that's connected to decentralized exchanges. So how do you understand that revenue sharing? So essentially, if you um, become a liquidity provider of certain type of uh, decentralized exchanges, uh, AMMs, uh, especially automated market makers, as discussed, um, then, uh, as mentioned in one of the previous slides, the traders instead of trading against each other, the traders, they're actually trading uh, against the liquidity pool. But who is providing liquidity pool, uh, liquidity uh, for the liquidity pool? Well, the liquidity providers. I know it's a bit mouthy, but uh, yeah, liquidity providers will provide liquidity to the liquidity pool. And uh, the incentive, the financial incentive for them to do that is because by doing so, they always uh, get, um, uh, some kind of fee. Uh, when users they 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 trade against the liquidity pool, they have to they have to pay uh, a little bit of fee, and that would ultimately go to uh, liquidity providers. So when you provide liquidity into a liquidity pool, what you would uh, get back is this liquidity provision certificate, which we call LP tokens. And with LP tokens, you are entitled to receive. Um, uh, exchange fees, uh, ultimately paid by exchange users. Uh, last but not least, liquidity mining, definitely not least because that's actually where the uh, majority of yields come from. And that is a, a particular feature of currently a lot of DeFi protocols is to incentivize uh, participation. So to incentivize participation, a lot of DeFi protocols will be uh, either airdropping or distributing based on uh, some kind of uh, some kind of algorithm, um, their protocol native tokens. So here I list three examples curve. Um, that's to incentivize uh, activity on uh, on curve finance, which is uh, which is uh, 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 again an AMM and also uni. Um, this is the protocol token for Uniswap. Again, it's also used to uh, incentivize participation. Uh, also liquidity provision on Uniswap. And then Comp, that's Compound. So Compound at once was rewarding both borrowers and lenders uh, uh, on the, uh, that participate in the, in the Compound protocol. So basically, those, because those um, protocol native tokens are tradable and also valuable assets. So if you participate in the protocol, um, you would get distributed with those uh, protocol tokens. So for example, if you participate in, uh, in, in the Compound protocol as a lender, not only would you receive lending interest as part of the yield, but also you would get rewarded by the protocol um, through um, the comp uh, native token. And you know that this also uh, would be would be considered as part of the yield because you can you know sell co uh, comp token uh, in an open market and then uh, basically monetize your reward. Pause a bit to see if there are questions. Okay, so far so good. Right, so this uh, slide shows uh, kind of an example of how um, yield farming process uh, works, a typical yield farming example. So here we have farmers, well, they're basically yield aggregator uh, users. We call them farmers because they like to farm yields. And the farmers would interact with the yield aggregator pool, uh, which is in phase zero. So essentially the, 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 the retail users uh, will deposit crypto assets into the yield aggregator pool. Um, and of course, whenever they wish, they can also withdraw their funds. Um, so those assets would either be deployed directly for strategy execution uh, if those assets are kind of eligible assets for strategy um, execution. For example, the strategy only takes, let's say, stablecoin, USDT. And as a farmer, you only have, uh, let's say, uh, DAI. Um, then potentially what's going to happen is that it will go first to phase one. So potentially, you know, the, 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 the your aggregator 
would um, deposit your DAI into a lending protocol to 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 borrow some 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 other stablecoin USDT for strategy execution, and then go to phase two. So basically, phase one is to cleanse the um, assets that are originally um, deposited by farmers and transform them into uh, eligible uh, eligible farmable uh, assets. And then you go to phase two for some strategy execution. We'll take a look into that later. And last but not least, you will be claiming a generated yield. And uh, you, can do, you can do whatever you wish with the yield. You can either uh, withdraw the yield or usually to achieve some kind of compounding effect, uh, the yield will be reinvested, um, uh, sold into the original, original pool such that the pool's TVL, total value locked, uh, would increase. And then it uh, goes into the first full circle again. OK. So as said, the most exciting phase of this whole yield farming protocol would be the, um, the second phase, phase two, the, 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 the strategy execution phase. So here, let's have a quick look at the strategy execution. Um, on the far left-hand side, you would have static assets. What, what does that mean, static assets? That's kind of the, 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 uh, the term that we dubbed for, for assets such as here we say ETH or USDC. It means that if you have those assets in your wallet, uh, if you don't touch them, they don't really do anything. They will always stay like that, which is why we call them static. Um, the, um, they are the opposite uh, of yield bearing assets. So how do you turn static assets into yield bearing assets? Well, you invest your static assets uh, through some smart contract and turn them into yield bearing assets. Typical yield bearing assets, as mentioned in the slide, if you remember, when we talk about source of yield, typical yield bearing assets include A tokens, which is a yield bearing asset for uh, from Aave, C tokens, a yield bearing asset from Compound, and LP tokens. Um, again, with LP tokens, liquidity provider tokens, you uh, are eligible um, for uh, exchange fees collected by the uh, by the AMM uh, DEX pools. So after the static uh, assets um, are transformed into yield bearing assets, all you need to do pretty much is just to wait. Um, as the time goes, your 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 um, assets will just increase in value. Um, here. I would like to go a little bit deeper to, to talk about the intricacies between the difference between um, A tokens and C tokens. Um, they are both uh, yield bearing tokens from two very similar lending protocols. Their mechanism of yield, um, of yield generating is slightly different um, on the code basis. So for A tokens, if you, let's say you um, deposit one USDC, into Aave, you will get equivalently one AUSDC. And the way that A tokens generate yield is that the quantity of A tokens would increase in your wallet. Uh, whereas if you deposit USDC into Compound, you will get some C USDC, um, but the quantity will never change. Um, but instead, the exchange rate between USDC and CUSDC will change such that, well, ex the exchange rate will always move um, if the, uh, the protocol works well. Um, the C, um, one C token will be worth uh, more and more USDCs such that when you redeem uh, C tokens, when you give up C tokens in exchange for the underlying asset, um, the longer you wait, the more that you can redeem the underlying asset. So that's for phase two, um, yield farming uh, um, strategy execution. So here, next, what I want to show you is some uh, numerical uh, simulations to give you a more tangible um, kind of understanding of uh, how risky or not so risky of certain uh, yield farming strategies are. Uh, here, just, uh, just a few assumptions, mainly for uh, simplicity purposes. So in, the, in this simple um, high level 
simulation, we, we, we neglect transaction costs. So we really just look at different types of uh, yield farming strategies. We assume that the uh, yield farming pool has the original value of one, just one unit. And then we also assume that the aggregator supplies um, all their funds into some kind of yield generating uh, protocol. Um, and in this yield generating protocol, the, the assets supplied by the aggregator would represent 1% of the uh, protocol's total assets. So very little. So which means that um, if the aggregator supplies funds into a, into a protocol, it does not really move the market. It does not really dilute the market. Again, it's an assumption for, for simpli uh, simplification purposes. Um, also, we consider uh, uh, liquidity mining. So we consider that when we uh, put our uh, assets into a yield generating protocol, the, the protocol, whether it's going to be a lending protocol or an AMM DEX, is going to distribute some native token uh, back to the yield aggregator. Uh, and we also assume that the native uh, token price will remain constant during the simulation period. Um, next, we just impose some arbitrary uh, borrow APY um, when we deal with lending protocols. So we assume that uh, when we interact with the lending protocol, there is a borrow interest of 10%. Um, and, uh, and also we assume that um, uh, there's a collateral factor of 80%, which means that you know when you when you put some assets into the lending protocol, you're allowed to take out 80% um, uh, 80 of the value of the assets that you deposited in. Um, next, we uh, also assume that the AMM, when we deal with the AMM, has a fixed exchange fee of 5% and applies this constant product conservation function, basically X times Y is equal to Z, where X and Y represents the quantities of the, uh, of the two um, assets of the asset pair in the, in the pool. And this fee is charged uh, it's a common practice by retaining 5% of the theoretical idealized fee-free purchase quantity uh, within the AMM pool. So I know that's a lot of assumptions, but uh, the basic idea is that we are just going to be looking at the, um, uh, the, the the pure effect of the strategy execution. We, we, we forget about as much as possible uh, market frictions or, or, or impact uh, due to, due to uh, kind of uh, um, uh, um, uh, well, the, 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 the effect of the mar market impact. Um, due to uh, APY dilution. So um, the first yield farming algorithm that I'm introducing here is also the most, um, let's say, fundamental and most trivial one. It's basically simple lending. And that is connected to what we have discussed, um, the, uh, the, the source of yield um, coming from uh, borrowing demand. So what you do, is very simple. You deposit assets. Well, the, not you, but rather the yield aggregator will deposit assets into a lending uh, protocol. And then all you need to do is just to wait as with the passage of time, the, uh, the interest will be accrued. It's the supply interest because you're depositing. And also, as mentioned, because you're also collecting native tokens, uh, as this is kind of liquidity mining, the, 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 the assuming that the lending protocol will be rewarding um, uh, lenders for their protocol participation. So you will also be collecting protocol native tokens. And then as the final step, you would just report, withdraw your, your deposits uh, together with the accrued supply interest. And also you would be collecting some uh, uh, native protocol token. So how does the return look like? Well, here we have a few examples. Um, so uh, you can see that um, uh, we have the simple lending, um, uh, simple lending APY dependent on the lending APY and also on the governance token price. 
uh, you see that the, 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 the lending APY, it's also quite uh, intuitive. The higher the lending APY, obviously, um, the higher the yield farming APY is. So the higher the uh, yield aggregator pool value would become. But also, um, as you are also rewarded, the yield aggregator is also rewarded with governance token. So obviously all other things equal, the um, higher value the governance token becomes, the higher uh, yield farming pool value would become, right? As you can see here, um, the slope, all other things equal, as you can see, the slope of the blue line, for example, is, is, is higher than the slope of the blue line here. So that's simple lending. I believe that's quite intuitive. And next, what we want to talk about is a slightly more complicated strategy. It's called leveraged borrow. So with leveraged borrow, in the first step, similar with, similarly with simple lending, you deposit some assets into a lending, uh, lending protocol. And then with the deposit assets acting as collateral, you can borrow some assets out from the lending protocol. Uh, remember, we said that um, the, 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 most of the lending protocols in DeFi currently only, um, only do uh, over collateralized lending, which means that you have to have deposit first acting as collateral before you can borrow some assets out. So um, after borrowing some assets out, in the third step, you deposit your borrowed assets back into the lending protocol. And you repeat uh, step two and three multiple times to create this kind of borrow spiral, leveraged borrow is what we call. Um, and then you would accrue interest and also uh, collect native tokens over time. Remember in our assumptions, we assume that the uh, lending protocols would reward both uh, borrowers and lenders, which was actually what happened with Compound. Back then with Compound, even if you're borrowing, you get rewarded with Comp Token. So that that triggered, incentivized a lot of people to borrow just pretty much for no reason, really just to collect the, the Comp Reward Tokens such that they can then you know uh, monetize cash out with the Comp Reward Token. Uh, such that even though they're 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 having a big borrow, they can they they're still earning a positive APY. So, again, step five: you accrue interest um, and collect native tokens um, uh, rewarded by lending protocol uh, over time. Uh, in the sixth step, you can swap your native tokens back into the assets borrowed, such that you can repay your loans. And then finally, you can withdraw your deposits um, with the accrued supply interest whenever, whenever you wish. But uh, of course, in between, um, you also need to um, uh, make sure that your, your um, position is, your borrow position is always over collateralized because we have this situation, we have this mechanism called liquidation with a lot of lending protocols. When your borrow position is not over collateralized, then you, uh, your, your um, deposit will be slashed, will be liquidated. So here in um, this slide, uh, we show the simulated result um, for uh, the leveraged borrow strategy. So as you can see that, let's, let's just look at the bright side. Um, on the far right hand side uh, of the plot, um, you can see that the governance token price um, is relatively high compared to the other scenarios. So you generally uh, have a high APY and also the, the, the higher number of spirals um, that's been conducted, the higher APY it will be generated because, because it has a compounding effect you, you, and also you, uh, you would receive native tokens both as a borrower and as a lender. So obviously the more spiral um, uh, that's been conducted, the more kind of nested borrow and nested lending that's been counted. So the more uh, governance tokens you would be able to collect. Um, however, this 
can be very dangerous, or this can actually be the strategy can actually be loss generating if the governance token price is low, and uh, we can see on the uh, left hand side uh, when the governance token is actually it's it's obviously the other side of the the, the, the spectrum uh, is equal to zero. Then the higher number of spirals you conduct. Um, the more loss you're generating because uh, you are always um, paying more interest for your borrow than than interest for um, uh, than receive than 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 the interest that you receive uh, for lending. So the third um, yield farming algorithm that I would like to talk about here is liquidity provision. That's connected to the um, the the um, uh, source of yield that's uh, kind of revenue sharing um, through liquidity provision. So that's also quite straightforward. It's the first step, you just provide assets as liquidity into a uh, liquidity pool of a, an, an AMM DEX. And then you would be, well, you would be receiving, um, uh, you'll be entitled for uh, the, the exchange fees. Obviously the exchange fees, they're not explicitly paid, but they're implicitly kind of implied uh, in the pool because every time the uh, exchange user is doing a swap, then part of their token will be retained in the pool. So it's the, the exchange fee is paid uh, implicitly, but also at the same time, um, the liquidity providers, they can also collect native uh, protocol tokens over time. And then as a final step, they can withdraw their liquidity whenever they wish. So here, I also plot a few scenarios uh, to demonstrate that uh, liquidity provision can also be both, um, can also be both uh, uh, revenue generating or profit generating, but also loss generating. Um, it's quite self-explanatory that obviously the more the higher governance token price, uh, the higher yield uh, you would get. But also here, a, 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 a even more, even kind of stronger yield differentiator here is the market movement. As we can see that if the market just move back and forth, if buy and sell quantity uh, cancel each other out, um, which is the uh, which is green line? You would actually have a uh, have a positive yield. However, if the market is moved to some certain direction um, that is um, uh, to, to some certain direction, actually the yield farming process can also be. Um, can also be loss generating. Um, just to give you an example, um, if you provide yield, uh, sorry, if you provide liquidity um, with, um, let's say, DAI and another token, let's say my token, whatever that is, um, and then if the uh, if the exchange traders they come to your liquidity pool, and all they do is to dump uh, the my tokens into the uh, into the liquidity pool, then throughout time, your uh, liquidity pool will be left only with this, 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 this my token uh, because of too much supply in the market, which uh, suppress the price. Um, and obviously, if your, uh, if your uh, yield or your profit is denominated in DAI, instead of my token, then you're gonna have a negative, uh, negative uh, yield. However, uh, if it's the other way around, if a lot of people are buying uh, my token from your, from your pool, that's gonna, uh, on one hand side, push the value of my token up. And on the other hand side, they will put more DAI into the liquidity pool. So obviously when the liquidity pool is denominated in DAI, then the value of the liquidity pool would also increase. So this is also very, very important to note uh, with, uh, with this strategy, liquidity provision, the, uh, the market movement, uh, which side is moving to, it's, it's, it, it's, um, uh, it, it determines whether your yield is gonna be uh, positive or negative. Um, so in this slide, we just summarize what we discussed. Um, 
So with uh, classic yield farming strategies, obviously, as we have seen, um, it can generate both uh, positive APY or negative APY. So there are definitely risks associated with yield farming activities. There is never free lunch. Um, high, uh, high yields uh, are always associated with also high volatility. So uh, here we summarize a, a bunch of risks. Um, we have lending and borrowing risks associated with lending protocols. Um, and uh, under that category, uh, there is liquidity risk. So if you put your money into a lending protocol and there's not much liquidity, there's not much uh, borrow demand, then uh, well, your, your APY, uh, annual percentage yield, I, I think I didn't even uh, explain uh, this term APY, annual percentage yield, basically your return would be low if there's no um, uh, borrow demand dri driving the um, supply interest. And also as said, there is liquidation risk that is associated to the second strategy, which is leveraged borrow. If you do leverage borrow, you borrow and then you redeposit your borrow and then you borrow again uh, to form this kind of uh, 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 borrow spiral, then it's it's highly risky because your uh, your 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 uh, if you don't pay attention and your position goes under under not sufficiently collateralized, not even under collateralized, uh, but just not sufficiently collateralized, then your assets, your original deposits, can be sl slashed. Um, next, we have composability risks. Um, that's kind of peculiar to how smart contracts work. So with individual smart contracts, there are risks, vulnerabilities, but also because yield farming, as we can see, yield farming protocols, they actually connect to uh, various other protocols. They're connected to lending protocols and AMM decks. So sometimes um, even those protocols, they can operate relatively um, with relatively low risk but when they are combined together there could be there could be unforeseeable risks that's what we call as composability risks uh, the third category of risks that we identify uh, is the apy instability um, if you go to a lot of yield farming um, protocols, you could probably sometimes see, especially I think in, 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 in 2020, there's one period when there's just ridiculous APY advertised, like 500%, 200%, just insane. But really how sustainable um, are those APYs? Um, and we, we reckon that actually they, they are not really sustainable. There's actually a lot of factors that will contribute to the instability of those high APYs. Um, first, we have divergence loss or impermanent loss. That's connected to, um, as mentioned, the market movements um, that you can observe with AMM DEX. And then if there's low trading activity with AMM DEX, you wouldn't be able to collect a lot of fee. Um, so uh, with high trading activity, you will have high APY, low trading activity, you will probably have low APY. And then there's price fluctuations in liquidity incentives. As we've seen, uh, if the governance token in the end has a high value, then your APY is high. If the, the reward governance token has a low value, you will have low APY. Um, so yeah, all these would contribute to the um, instability, uh, in instability or potential unsustainability of those high APYs. Um, there's also, we have also observed attacks um, with, well, I see a, okay, I'm gonna pick up the question later. I'll be really fast, I'm almost done. So here, I just want to show a real life example, an empirical example um, of the performance of some pools. Um, those are, those are uh, kind of USD denominated uh, or rather DAI denominated, whatever the USD pegged stablecoin denominated pools. Um, you can see price per share. Um, uh, usually they go steadily upwards, but here you can see with the uh, with, uh, um, harvest, um, there was an uh, incident around um, November 2020, actually that's October 2020, 26th of October, there was this flash loan attack that occurred to harvest. 
um, that uh largely affected the 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 price per share of uh their usdc vault so again uh that's connected to the composability risks that we just did just discussed so uh, the yield aggregator uh, smart contract algorithm it by itself is probably okay the lending protocol um algorithms they're probably okay but when they're combined uh there can be troubles so this is just to demonstrate that and last but not least, as said, I want to just uh, uh, present. There's obviously we cannot exhaust all the lending, uh, all the yield aggregators out there. But just as an example of an emerging uh, yield farming protocol, this Bank of Chain, just to demonstrate kind of the development trajectory in this field. So this is a smart multi-chain yield optimizer that provides long-term, near at least they claim near risk-free return. So here, the 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 the, um, uh, the the features that current investors they're looking for due to the uh, past associated attacks with with yield aggregators, they're looking for something a little bit more stable. Um, so so risk free is usually the selling point, and also multi chain. Um, as you can see, um, this particular protocol is connected to uh, Ethereum, BNB chain, Polygon, those e EVM compatible chains. Um, so that's all. I know my time is up. Thank you very much for your attention. And I'm happy to share the slides as well. Here you can just see all the references that are used uh, in the presentation. Thank you. Lovely. Thanks a lot, Java, for the wonderful talk. Uh, I think from the finance and economic side of things, there would be a lot of questions, uh, but I, I, there are a few questions already. Do you want to take those? Yeah. Uh, yes. Um, wow. Okay. Uh, Bruno is asking, what are your thoughts, insights so far on risk, propagation, and inflation through uh, protocol compositions? Um, <clears throat> Actually, I need to. I, I need you to uh, kind of parse this question a little bit for me. What do you mean by uh, inflation through uh, protocol compositions? Inflation uh, in terms of what? Yeah. So if you have, let's say, a liquidation risk mm -hmm. in one protocol, and this protocol is part of some larger construct, some larger composition, um, could the risk? I mean, I don't know if the risk could be quantified, but um, how, how yeah. could this risk infl inflate become larger? Oh, um, yeah, it, yeah, 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 it can definitely cause like this kind of butterfly effect, uh, which which we have already seen. Like this is also again, it's it's connected to uh, to to uh, composability risks. Uh, actually, I think we do we have a. Actually, this paper here, liquidations, DeFi on the knife edge. Here we talked about the composition, a specific uh, example of composition risk. It was it was uh, uh, with regard to uh, Dai and uh, and and Compound. Those are two separate lending protocols. But uh, uh, because because people were crazy about again, actually yield farming, they're crazy about yield farming. They keep borrowing, uh, which caused uh, de-pegging between uh between DAI and usd and then that also triggered a large amount of liquidation uh that was quite interesting so uh definitely there's yeah so so i would say uh the the the, the, the there is butterfly effect there's domino effect uh and it can go wrong very quickly okay, Thanks. next question for someone who hasn't done yield farming yet i particularly wonder about the Spiraling, I guess. Uh, if I want to get out of position that I'm sort of uh, spiraled into, do I need to spiral out of it, or can I withdraw all my assets uh, instantly? Uh, good question. Let me. I'm trying to think. Um, I well, so so um, every time you um, every time you deposit you would get, every time you deposit, you would get the um, deposit certificate, right? Such as some kind of C token. And then you can use that to, uh, 
and then you can use uh, you can you can use your deposit to act as collateral to borrow out some assets and then redeposit in. So from an accounting perspective, um, with this spiral, what you gonna what you gonna build up is that you're gonna build up both your liability side and also your asset side. Um, they are not really if you are if you are if you are always constantly borrowing the same assets, um, the number is just gonna increase. So to answer your question, uh, you don't have to like bit by bit spiral out. You can you can repay your you can kind of like uh, rebalance your 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 liability uh, with one go. So you just you just you just repay everything. So again, from accounting perspective, your 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 uh, liabilities um, uh, value is just go, gonna go up. So um, yeah. So the first uh, borrow and the second borrow. Due to the spiral leverage, uh, there's it's not differentiated uh, in the smart contract. Great, thanks. Thanks, and Michael, uh, who is in charge of the parameter strategies of those yield farming services, are those services also those services take fees? Of their services, if so, they're competing. Uh, is there com competition regarding those fees? Yeah, definitely. Um, so, who's in charge of those parameters? Um, uh, I can't answer you the I can't give you a generic answer because they're always different usually at the very beginning they are just determined by the uh, by the protocol foundation the the, the initial development uh, team and then usually they once they grow the community they would give the power to the DAO and those yield farming um, th those yield farming protocols they themselves also send reward tokens to their to their farmers right like a like year in finance there's uh, there's also the the protocol token um uh, out there to 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 incentivize uh, participation so once the once the dao um is formed then the dao can vote for parameter change so yeah so i would say i would say initially definitely the, the original development team and if the community is big enough there is a proper dao set up then the community would decide uh, on the parameter, decide and vote on the parameters. Um, are there fees? Um, uh, yes, there are. There are fees. So, so um, uh, they they have to be. There have to be fees. Usually, those fees uh, can be, you know, sent to a treasury, and then that that uh, that can in one way or another. Uh, be connected to uh, the token holder benefits. So otherwise, you know, if when, once the once the uh, yield farming protocol is um, assumed taken over by the DAO, um, every every DAO member would would hold some kind of uh, uh, yield farming protocol uh, governance tokens. But uh, apart from voting rights, what is the value that's backing those governance tokens? Well, the value the value actually comes from the revenue stream. So yeah, there will be some kind of fees, but eventually, uh, it's yeah, it's all it's all benefiting the the community anyway. Um, compete. Uh, there's competition regarding those fees. I think I think it's not just the fee. Uh, as shown, there's also risk factor. So so I guess if you are very uh, very kind of reputable established yield farming protocol um, uh, with low risk uh, and also incorporate some kind of insurance uh, protocol, then you can charge a higher fee and the, the users can tolerate that. However, if, you, you're, if you're just a, a new uh, yield farming protocol, uh, like I, I was showing Bank of Chain um, is very unknown, then at the very beginning, you probably need to Charge extremely low fee, or even no fee at all, or even, or even you know, uh, subsidize uh, some transaction fee to attract users at the very beginning. So I guess the same economics just work uh, also work in the in the in the open competitive market in traditional finance as well. I hope that answers your question. Yes. Right. Lovely. Thanks a lot. Java, I do not see other questions. Thank, thank you so much for that wonderful keynote talk. Uh, it was great. I think um, Arthur is still here. I don't know what you think of the ramifications of BEVs or MEVs along with the yield aggregators. So, yeah. All right. 
um, I guess, Chawa, um, thanks a lot for your talk. We move on to our technical paper presentation next, after the invited lecture. We'll go in a different direction. We are going towards analysis of arbitrary content on blockchain-based systems using BigQuery. Uh, I believe Marcel would be presenting the paper on behalf of the authors. Marcel, your stage. Yes, yeah. And share. Thank you. Uh, I think my internet is lagging. Can you can you hear me? We can hear you, yes. But your video is frozen, so yeah, yeah. I had I had unstable internet connection, but I, I hope now it's uh, it will go well. All right. Yeah, so thank you very much. I guess I can start. Sure. Yeah, thank you very much also for the uh, introduction. Um, so we, we have analyzed some blockchains regarding their arbitrary content using BigQuery. And what all that means in particular, we are going to find out. So at first, I want to talk a little bit about our motivation. Why was it even interesting to look at arbitrary data? And of course, what does that even mean in the first place? Then about the method, I don't assume every one of you to be familiar with BigQuery, so we are going to talk about that. And the actual analysis then is subdivided into a text analysis and a files analysis. You will see some quantitative results, but I also brought some findings with me, so it's going to be a little bit more fun for you than just looking at numbers. And finally, a few takeaways. So, um, at first, that's that's a rec an actual recognition. Transactions can contain arbitrary data. Uh, by arbitrary data, we mean basically any intentional sequence of bytes, which can represent any form of digital data, from text messages to whole Netflix movies, um, everything. Uh, that, of course, obviously depends on the underlying protocol. But we also have to understand that you cannot build a protocol unless it really has very primitive features. You cannot build it um, completely preventing users from intentionally inserting their arbitrary content. And then I wanted to recall that transactions on the blockchain are at least potentially anonymous. They are tamper-proof and permanent. They could stay there maybe forever. And that's a very interesting combination of features, a very powerful one. Also, you could think of some benign use cases, but there's also a criminal potential one has to acknowledge. Um, and that's, on the one hand, it's, it's harmful to society, of course, but it also criminalizes the possession of a copy of the blockchain and thus uh, poses a threat to decentralized systems in general. Another kind of side motivation of this work is you wanted to evaluate BigQuery as a means of doing that. We, our goal was to use results from a previous study that has been done um, to find arbitrary content on Bitcoin, just to kind of prove our methodology. But spoiler alert, we were able actually to reproduce those results as well. So I've mentioned it now a few times, BigQuery, uh, for those who do not know. BigQuery is an API offered um, in the Google Cloud platform, and it allows you to formulate queries in SQL to process very large data sets um, entirely in the cloud. So also, the data set is uh, hosted in the cloud, and by Google's nature, it's very fast. And the big benefit, of course, is uh, it does not require any hardware uh, from your side, you don't need like big processing power. You don't need the disk space needed for uh, huge blockchains, obviously. And um, it's also really cool that you can use SQL because it's very, it's a very powerful language uh, with many uh, functions as well. We, for example, use uh, regex functions excessively for our purpose. And the nice thing about and another nice thing about BigQuery in our case was it, it does offer some public data sets for apparently popular use cases. And they included a couple of cryptocurrencies, 
And among others, they included Bitcoin and Ethereum. Um, and yeah, we chose to take those as a representation of blockchain-based systems because truth is they are by far the largest blockchains running out there. So you get this real-time reflection of those blockchains in the form of relational databases. You get your transaction tables and blocks tables and all the protocol fields are translated to table fields and you have all the values in hex strings, which makes it really convenient to query those using SQL and its utilities. Um, so here we identified a few fields uh, where we thought of were reasonable and feasible to, to use for intentional uh, for intentional content insertions. And those were the ones that we targeted for our SQL queries. Um, the basic approach, as you can see in the graphics below, was to get the data from BigQuery to our local SQLite database. And from there on, we could make further investigations. Sometimes we would have post-processing scripts uh, to further filter the results or just do some analysis. We are now talking about the text analysis. What we did here was looking for transactions which had the purpose, obviously, to submit some text messages on to the blockchain. So what we did here was um, we looked for strings of UTF-8 characters. We got ourselves a list of all UTF-8 characters and their hexadecimal representation. And then we made um, a regex pattern that just looked for a combination of those characters of arbitrary length. Uh, as you can see here in an example of the SQL for Ethereum. And in the result, we found almost 2.7 million, what we called defined as text, transact tra text transactions. And um, one observation you can make here is one that you will continue to make throughout the presentation. Uh, Ethereum is very dominant here. We believe that this is uh, due to its, um, it's actually much more convenient to post arbitrary content on Ethereum. Um, as I said earlier, the, the more features you want your protocol to allow, the more space the attacker has to, to um, insert arbitrary content. And also, I think probably most of the time it was cheaper to post transactions in Ethereum than it was in Bitcoin. We have also we also did some classification. We looked for some popular uh, text-based structures. At this point, actually, I want to show you some results in our SQLite database. I apologize for the small font size, but uh, however, you can see many duplicates. That's one common thing. You can also see many um, mining pool advertisements. So that's something you would maybe also expect. Um, text messages, or for example, here it says AK47 payout for deposit, payout eight out of 50 and the 14 and, 14 and others. So that's uh, quite interesting, although uh, maybe someone should investigate this. Um, yeah, we also see many JSON structures um, and also just normal text messages. Here's another plot where you can see the frequency of those transactions over time, um, where you just see again that it's how dominant it is um, for Ethereum rather than on Bitcoin. We also did another more exhaustive search for URLs, specifically HTTP and IPFS, with special attention for darknet links, um, just because URLs tend to be very fun. You can outsource content and we, uh, yeah, we found a lot, much more that we could investigate on, in the, on an individual level, but we took a sample for both blockchains and just checked for the type of content uh, to see what it is about most of the time. And um, it was very much cryptocurrency related stuff like homepages of ICOs, um, et cetera. And in the case of Ethereum, we found a lot of NFT metadata, so those uh, 
JSON files hosted by some centralized uh, websites. So a lot of OpenSea.com and, and other platforms. Um, continuing with the files analysis, maybe the more interesting one because you have more complex data kind of. Uh, what we did here was we thought of a list of uh, popular file types like PNG and JPEG, but also PDF. We tried to pick from different domains of files. And uh, then we got ourselves the file signatures and we were looking for those sequences of bytes, those file signatures in transactions. And then we try to assemble a whole file by just, by just um, following those bytes. And it got us a lot of false positives too. Um, it depends on the, it does depend on the length of, of the file signature too. Uh, but yeah, that's why we had some post processing steps. We had one automatic one that would filter out a lot. And then we had the process of manual review of each finding to see if the files were actually readable and viewable by standard software, uh, which was actually possible because it, it was not that many. It was a couple hundreds. Um, here we have listed them uh, categorized by their file type. You can see most were images, uh, but also many archives. Although I want you to note that um, many, like there were many insertions done by a small group of individuals. Uh, we even found three audio files and some PDF files. And I want to show you some images. I selected a sample I thought of as representative of what we found. So um, yeah, it's, it's still the internet. So uh, there were some cats to, to be found, um, stuff like that too. And I have blurred the faces because there are many actual private photos of um, important moments, also like wedding days, even birth certificates, which was really cool. Uh, you, you can see a sense of perpetuation here, I think. Uh, we had some memes. I, I picked my, my, my favorite one that, I, uh, that we found on the blockchain. We had crypto-related stuff. Um, here again, many portraits, private pictures, and also just random stuff. Uh, which we have also categorized here. So yeah, as as uh, as uh, uh, kind of as what I've uh, shown you before, there has been some, although not many, but there has also been some offensive, political, and um, explicit images. Yeah. Um, so uh, the qualitative observations we could make after a little more investigation than we could do in this short time was uh, for the text analysis we found, and that was very interesting in my opinion, we found out that there are organizations, uh, namely Kraken, but also others, I think, that make use of the abuses of the protocol by establishing text-based structures like JSON, and then have automated scripts on their side for receiving transactions. Uh, which I think is a very creative use case of um, this method. Also, we found even bi-directional messaging from um, private wallet accounts. Uh, I followed one conversation that went, it, often it was someone that sends his or her funds to the wrong address. Uh, so then you have, of course, only one, like that's the only way you can contact the other person sometimes because it's, uh, the person is anonymous and um, sometimes they would even reply and have a little conversation. We have seen perpetuation as a motivation and the following is rather an assumption. We cannot know, but we found some seven zip archives that were password protected. And the only idea we had was maybe uh, people used this uh, method as um, kind of a decentralized cloud storage for files, which is also a creative idea and use case for that. 
um, if, if, if you, especially if you think that those blockchains will persist for, for a very long time. And uh, finally, that of course was interesting. We were able to find um, not only offensive, but illegal content on both blockchains um, uh, by most countries' standards, which uh, was unfortunate, but also kind of expected. Yeah, and uh, to conclude, because this work was also um, to a degree an evaluation of BigQuery. Uh, BigQuery is awesome also for that purpose. I'm not going to talk more about its advantages because I, I think I have already enough. Uh, just a couple of things to keep in mind. Uh, programming errors can be expensive. It's still a cloud service, uh, of course. And then we have experienced some limits, um, intentional limits set by Google Cloud. Uh, for example, uh, regarding sub queries in really uh, complex SQL queries, and also they uh, seem to have disabled grouping expression in regex patterns. Yeah, so that's it. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask now or contact us. Um, the tool that we built to provide this analysis, get the data from the query and everything, uh, is actually open source. You can find it in GitHub, also together with um, the publication. So yeah, thank you very much. And excuse the internet connection. I'm not sure if it was uh, went. So soon. it was perfectly fine, Marcel. Thanks a lot. Okay, great, great. So Marcel, there are a few questions from Bernard and Malta. Do you want to pick them from the chat? Uh, oh yeah. Um, right, the chess. Okay. Um, I think it starts here with Bernard's question. During the during the peak of the blockchain hype, many use Ethereum to store hashes uh, computed over some external data sets. Maybe I missed it, but do you see this in your data? Um, Um, we, I, I'm not sure if this is what you mean, but we found, um, as you mem remember, maybe we classified the textual content that we find in different um, uh, uh, types of text structures, and there ha has been much hex, but also basic, like base sixty four encoded text, which looked like hashes, but um, although oh, you can only assume what they were for what they meant. Um, I hope that answers your question. Yes, it does. But did you see, so especially for the for the hex data, do you see any um, temporal, correlation or... temporal trend there? Yeah, no, we didn't. Uh, we did not investigate uh, the the timeline okay. for that, so because yeah, I assume yeah. that this line is basically uh, a lot of hashes computed by external yeah. platforms uh, that just dump the hashes to to Ethereum. Yeah, but theoretically, you 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 could plot it from from the database. You have the timestamps and uh, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thanks for the question. And Thank then you. Malta asks for NFT metadata. Curious if you have any insights into whether that's mostly an expected standardized format, such as your I logs, or, okay, or if there was a lot of content in unusual, unrecognized formats. Um, I gotta say, I'm not. I'm not really familiar with not really educated in what is the standard for NFT metadata. It was, yeah, how, how should it look? You would see certain, certain topics. So like Ethereum contracts emit these logs. And so I was wondering if, if you looked at the logs and if you matched that to certain standards. So for example, for the URI standard, you would expect a certain signature and you would know how to parse the subsequent data fields and this way you could basically see whether like those nft projects use those standards or 
or put their data still in there, but in, in some formats that are not like widely known or available. Okay, um, we, we did not pay special attention to that. The way that we classified this as, as NFT metadata was um, just by finding a JSON containing the typical fields like name description and trade type. Uh, yeah, so it, it looked very obviously like NFT metadata, but that's okay. all I, I can say. Thank you too. Um, do you plan to keep using BigQuery given the limitations? Uh, yeah, of course, because you can always work those around by having multiple queries or post-processing scripts. Most of the time we, we use a combination of both, um, but it does not feel very limiting. Yeah, it's, it's a very, very powerful tool. Are there contents that you have been, that have been produced through multiple transactions? Um, yes, yes, especially for the, uh, um, it was very obvious for some images that appeared to be cut. And um, we did the inter investigation maybe one or two times to reassemble the file by, um, looking at the consecutive transactions and then reassembling a whole image um but yeah it was not not a main goal or in the scope of this research we should also note that we did not we don't think that we found every any everything that appears on the blockchain but uh we think we found something and um we found definitely found what our methodology allowed us to find but sure you could have extended it uh, to that as well yeah thanks yeah I think the uh, that question we had covered a little bit already um, at the same time, I'm, as I said, I'm not very educated in uh, the NFT protocols. To get an abstract idea, what was the actual costs that this analysis had led to? Um, not much, a few hundred dollars, but the, it was, of course, a process to develop it. Um, I think, actually, running the analysis once after everything was done uh, was maybe only thirty dollars but i'm not very sure but it was not too much yeah um yeah. thanks a lot Thank for some things yeah thanks for a great talk it's a very new approach to looking at data mining on the blockchain Lovely. Thank you so much. All right. Um, given that talk, we are left with one more technical presentation. But I believe as the presentation on OpenSea NFT marketplace categorization are from authors from New Zealand, and it would be almost early morning for them. They sent us a recorded video. May I request, um, Romain, would you be able to play the video for us, please? Thank you. Yes, I will. So I think for this one, as it's a video, in case we have questions, okay. um, we can connect directly with the authors. You'll find the author names on our website. Thank you. Um. Okay, do you do you see it or do you have to? Oh, uh, yes, we see it. Um, okay, don't hear it so, yet. Yeah, I need to launch it. Let's go. Okay. Hello, everyone, and thank you for attending this presentation on our paper, which covers characterization of the OpenSea NFT marketplace. My name is Brian White, and I'm a student at the University of Auckland in New Zealand, where I'm studying a Bachelor of Science with a specialization in data science. Now, unfortunately, due to time zones, I am unable to present this to you all live, but I hope you enjoy this recorded presentation. Should you have any questions on the subject, contact details will be on the last slide, so please feel free to reach out. We would love to hear from you. We're going to start off with an overview and introduction to the problem, as well as getting an understanding behind the motivation of the research topic. 
We'll then review the data collection process, as well as look at an overview of the sum of the key statistics about the data set. Finally, we will look at the key results, takeaways, and some concluding remarks. So let's get started, and we'll look at an introduction to NFTs in general, as well as an outline of our objective when approaching this subject. First, let's just take a brief moment to review some of the basics about NFTs and their role in the marketplace landscape. NFTs, or non-fungible tokens, are unique digital identifiers used to represent ownership of various crypto assets, which commonly include music, art, collectibles, or game assets. Assets are secured by the Ethereum blockchain. However, several other notable blockchain currencies are looking to support NFTs on their network. Through blockchain metadata, digital assets can replicate physical properties such as scarcity, uniqueness, and proof of ownership. The largest cryptocurrency exchange, Crypto.com, has reported that the number of active users has increased 178% in 2021, rising from 106 million users in January to 295 million users as of December. Generally, however, the blockchain and cryptocurrency landscape is quite daunting for the average person to understand. It's a relatively new digital medium that's largely misunderstood. That being said, there are numerous current state processes that can be improved by leveraging the power that blockchain can provide. There are many more practical uses that can be further developed, such as handling real estate contracts, wills, estate planning, movie releases, or even creative methods of crowdfunding. While uptake of NFTs and blockchain is relatively slow, the prospects are very up and coming and show great promise. To date, research into the NFT marketplace has been relatively limited. Much of the prior research has been focused on other aspects of the market, such as security, environmental impact, correlations of NFT pricing to crypto pricing, or simply looking at single collections in isolation. A relatively unexplored area of computing combined with a still developing social awareness creates a very intriguing and fascinating opportunity to explore the NFT marketplace in greater depth. It is important to have at least a general understanding of how these digital assets are created and sold. The diagram on the right is a very basic process flow that a typical NFT may undergo on a platform such as OpenSea. In the NFT flow, the first step is that a digital asset has to be created and its metadata is held within what is known as a smart contract. This is a program that runs on the blockchain. It's a grouping of code and state data. These contracts interact with users and can define rules such as a regular contract can, and it automatically enforces them via the code. From there, the asset is then minted on the Ethereum blockchain, which means a new block is created, validated, and then ultimately confirmed and added to the blockchain. Each asset has a unique identifier, which allows NFT creators to establish a level of scarcity for their assets. Smart contracts also associate a unique Ethereum wallet address as the owner of the NFT. The NFT can then be listed for sale on a compatible decentralized app, such as OpenSea. Should a sale occur, it would trigger the process in step two to repeat, a new block is created, broadcast, validated, and NFT ownership moves to a new wallet address. The key takeaway here is that each time a new block is validated and added to the blockchain, it creates an unalterable chain of transactions. That means there's a verifiable path that can establish ownership, which is a key element to NFTs. Our goal is to take a broad approach to analyzing NFTs and thereby offering a more generalist approach to understanding the evolution and trends of the market. We performed a longitudinal measurement study of the largest NFT marketplace, OpenSea. They dominate the NFT marketplace and have recorded $20.37 billion in sales with over 1.2 million active traders. For context, the following closest network has 950,000 active users. However, at the time of our study, only had a total sales volume of just over 360 million. So we seek to understand user behavior, economic trends, and network interactions. We feel that this will allow us to gain insights into the quickly evolving NFT landscape. In summary, we wish to produce an empirical study across a wide range of collections and categories to better understand market trends in general. From this, we expect to be able to better understand the market, predict possible future trends, as well as hopefully spur further research into this area. We will now look at the data collection process that was used to build our data set, as well as getting a brief overview of some of the key measurements of the data. To collect our data, we made use of the events endpoint of the OpenSea API. Data was collected only on successful sales that fell within the calendar years of 2019 through to 2021. 
Data retrieved from the API does not contain labeling about which particular category the NFT sale belonged to. Therefore, to know if the NFT could be considered as art, collectible, virtual worlds, etc., we web scraped the OpenSea sales browse page, which allowed you to filter by category or collection name. This way, we were able to establish a proper category for approximately 50,000 collections. Some collections were still not labeled after web scraping, so we looked at the, th the largest 1,000 collections where a category could not be established, and we did a manual check. This involved a review of several NFTs in each collection by hand and making a best guess judgment as to which category it should belong to. Now, the API returns over 200 attributes per NFT, so we took a smaller subset with fields relevant to our research. From this more manageable subset, we then derived several key attributes such as price, which needed to be converted based on the USD to Ethereum conversion rate at the point of the sale. This table here provides a breakdown of sales by category and year. Sales volume had a clear increase over this period. There was a 41% increase from 2019 to 2020, and then an incredible 3,857% increase from 2020 to 21. As a matter of fact, there were actually days in November 2021 which had more sales than the entirety of 2019 or 2020. Please note also music and photography were new categories to OpenSea at the very end of 2020. And as such data from 2019 and 2020 is essentially missing. Virtual worlds, which accounted for gaming based NFTs were the dominant category back in 2019, but they were very quickly overtaken by other categories that we feel had more speculative value, such as art and collectibles. Domains were also a very interesting category as they remained relatively flat over this time. Interest in this category has clearly not taken off. It's also important to just note that the art and collectible categories have a very significant overlap. Different marketplaces tend to categorize certain collections as art, whereas another may label that exact same collection as a collectible. There doesn't really appear to be any clear delineation how they're treated, so we use the terms art and collectible somewhat interchangeably. This table here shows the distinct count of buyers and sellers. We're able to represent the count of either user based on the unique Ethereum wallet address used in a particular transaction. It is likely that some users have multiple wallet addresses, however this count is still a rather good proxy for the overall user count. The ratio of buyers to sellers remained fairly consistent from 2019 to 2020 at 1.16 and 1.28 buyers per seller respectively. However, in 2021, when interest in NFTs really started to take off, this ratio jumped to 1.98, which is an increase of 55% over the previous year. The unique count of collections where at least one sale was made increased just over 44 fold between 2020 and 2021 to further illustrate the massive spike in interest that was generated towards NFTs in general. Of the nearly 600,000 recognized unique buyers in 2021, we can see that there are single days in that year where over 200,000 of those buyers were considered active. Similarly, more than 125,000 sellers were active on peak days. This peak in user activity also led to over 1.3 million distinct NFT transactions occurring in a single day. Transactions towards the end of 2021 started to drop quite sharply, however they still remained well above pre-2021 levels. It would be interesting to note how sales trends for 2022 and beyond compare relative to the levels of variability observed from 2020 to 2021. Overall, our data set contained just over 5.2 million unique NFT sales spanning January 2019 through December 2021. The total value in US dollars of all NFT sales within our data set is just under 10.8 billion US dollars. This is a staggering amount of money to be exchanged on just a single marketplace for digitized assets, and it could be indicative of future prospects for NFTs if the technology continues to mature. Now let's move on to review some of the key results and the main takeaways from the analysis of the OpenSea NFT data. The latest report released from the Non-Fungible Corporation noted that the number of sellers is growing faster than the number of buyers. However, we found that within the OpenSea marketplace, this was not the case. The growth of buyers is outpacing sellers by a rather large margin. From 2020 to 2021, there was an increase in unique buyers of 3,471%, whereas for sellers, they saw an increase of only 2,208%. In 2019, 
the average buyer would purchase approximately 5.7 NFTs in any given month. In 2020, this dropped to 4.7, and finally in 2021, it dipped again to 4.2. We speculate that this could be attributed to the shift in the mix of categories of NFTs which are being purchased, as well as the shifts in the median sales values. In 2019, we saw that the bulk of sales belonged to the virtual worlds category. However, by 2021, over 80% of all sales fell into the art or collectibles category. This supports previous research, which noted that the market volume has been largely dominated by NFT categories such as art, which since then have contributed 71% of the total transaction volume, followed by collectible assets accounting for 12%. Based on the speculative nature of NFT resale value, this is not entirely unexpected, as more users are looking to potentially turn profits on their purchases. We found that our data follows many real-world graphs of the internet or social media and are heavily right-skewed, which demonstrate the existence of several high-degree hubs. We found that the top 20% of buyers accounted for 79.7% of transactions, whereas the top 20% of sellers accounted for 83.4% of transactions. However, when looking at the most popular collections, the top 20% accounted for an impressive 97.4% of all transactions. If we plot the logged rank against the log frequency for which a particular buyer or seller address, it appears to closely fit a Laharriere stretched exponential distribution. Similarly, this applies for sales counts to a particular collection even more closely, and you can see this in the embedded graph. What became abundantly clear in our analysis of the NFT marketplace was that it was a system of extremes. Now, there's a common term to describe someone who spends far more than the typical platform user, and that's a heavy hitter. This is no different in the NFT space, as a small group of heavy hitters really tend to dominate the scene. Buyers in the 25th, 50th, and 75th quantiles held 1, 2, and 6 NFTs, respectively. Those in the top 1% of buyers held 108 or greater. Now, the largest buyer on record in our data set owned a very impressive 48,160 NFTs and actually is listed for zero sales. Sellers in the 25th, 50th, and 75th quantiles held one, three, or 10 NFTs. Those in the top 1% of sellers had sales of more than 228 NFTs in our three-year period. The most notable seller on our record is on account for 9,577 sales. Now the graph here shows a Lorenz curve which illustrates the percentile distribution for the cumulative percent of all sales or purchases. Now this indicates that the distribution is very heavily skewed towards the upper percentile for both buyers and sellers. It just shows how top heavy the marketplace is and how some power users really dominate the scene. When looking at the value of the NFT assets themselves, we found an extremely long tail of values. In our records, the highest value NFT sold for a whopping 2100 Ethereum, which was worth just over $8 million at this time of sale. If we look at the distribution of prices, we find that the 25th quantile for the cost was $206, 50th was 527, 75th was 1,368, and those NFTs which were in the top 1% by sales value were worth upwards of $25,000. For most NFT categories, there's an overall positive trend with pricing. However, they all tend to experience frequent price spikes, which may correlate art and collectibles had very frequent price spikes, which could relate to a strong primary and secondary sales market as opportunistic buyers are hoping to flip limited release NFTs for profit. That being said, we did find that 95% of all sales fell between $38 and $7,500 USD. Music and domains tended to have the lowest median value, whereas art, collectibles, and virtual worlds tended to have the highest median and therefore highest extreme values. A graph was created where each node represented a buyer or seller and an edge connected the nodes if any transaction was done between the two. Our particular network graph was comprised of just over 637,000 nodes. The graph was then analyzed using the Louvain algorithm, which extracts community-based structures from networks. This returns a measure known as modularity, which is a value between negative one and one, and it represents the density of links inside communities compared to those between communities. We had a modularity score equal to 0 0.282, which suggest, suggests a middling level of density. It's not entirely unexpected given the sheer volume of transactions and the number of buyers and sellers who own just a small number of NFTs. Furthermore, 
we found that our complete network graph consisted of just under 7,000 communities, but the top 10 communities accounted for 86.7% of all buyers and sellers. The largest community was around 165,000 nodes and represented just over 25% of the entire network. We found that the nodes of degree one through five comprised 70% of all nodes, and the average degree was 13.1. There is a clear Pareto effect within the data as the top 20% of buyers and sellers account for 80% of all transactions in the network, with the top 20% of collections making up 97.4% of the sales. NFT sales mix has shifted quite drastically from what was once a virtual worlds and gaming dominated market to one where buyers could be looking to capitalize on the NFT hype by getting into art and collectibles. The NFT marketplace is dominated by heavy hitters who spend far more than the typical user. The top 1% of buyers owned more than 108 NFTs, while the top 1% of sellers made at least 228 sales. Art and collectibles show a positive trend in their pricing over time, but were very susceptible to volatile price spikes. The network of buyers and sellers is primarily composed of a community structure as evidenced by the 10 communities accounting for 86.7% of buyers and sellers. The modularity value of 0.282 speaks to the sparsity outside of those communities. Nearly 70% of user nodes having a degree between one and five speaks to some level of interactivity between the average user and how the heavy hitters tend to operate. Using three years of sales data from the largest NFT marketplace, we've analyzed over 5 million sales records and have presented a study of findings surrounding user behavior, economic activity, and network interactions. OpenSea, and NFTs in general, have experienced tremendous sales growth from 2019 to 2021. Despite this, the NFT sales market is still in its infancy and has much more room to grow and mature. The global adoption of cryptocurrency will bring in a new wave of NFT enthusiasts, which, along with maturity and blockchain technologies, will further drive market growth. Further research could look at other notable NFT marketplaces to compare and contrast with our findings from OpenSea. Do other marketplaces adhere to the same observed sets of trends and behaviors? Thank you very much for listening in on this presentation about the characterization of the OpenSea NFT marketplace. As I mentioned in the opening, if you have any comments or questions, please contact myself or Anaket at the email addresses listed on the slide or on the paper itself. Thank you again, take care, and enjoy the rest of the conference. Right. Uh, thanks a lot, Romain, for playing the video. For those who have questions, I think some of the questions have been answered by Bernard and Walter. But yeah, sure. Uh, feel free to read the paper, uh, drop an email to the authors if you're interested. Uh, that brings us to the end. We are slightly over the time, but it's all right, I guess. Um, do I have Fridun? Yeah, hi, Fridun. So it's over to you for concluding remarks. Thanks a lot to everyone for joining. Right, so uh, we have now arrived at the end of the workshop. Um, we want to, of course, thank the speakers of the accepted papers for the very interesting talks on the probability and profitability of forks, analysis of content using BigQuery, and the characterization of the OpenSea NFT marketplace. In addition, of course, a big thanks goes to our invited speakers, Arthur Gervais and Javak Su and their talks on blockchain extractable value, high-frequency trading, yield aggregators, and DeFi. Thanks uh, to you, of course, as the attendees um, for your participation, the good questions and comments. And finally, we thank the reviewers and the organizers as without their dedicated work, um, this workshop would not have been possible. Um, we hope to host this crypto asset analytics workshop next year again with the web conference, which is planned to be held in Texas in May 2023. The exact location hasn't been announced yet, but with some luck, it will be an in person event this time, um, allowing for the casual exchange of ideas and feedback just like before the pandemic. Um, if you have any suggestions for improvements, um, we can also discuss them uh, now, or you can reach out to us at a later stage. Um, and with that, yeah, thank you again, everyone. And, uh, I let everyone enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you, Frita. Thank you everyone for thank coming everyone today. For it's nice to see everyone. Hopefully the next time it will be in person. Texas.
Thanks for joining. Thanks, Bernard. Thanks, Malta, for the program. It's great. Thanks, Fridham, for all you have. All right. I think uh, Reiner is not here with us anymore. Yeah. All right. Awesome. Have a good day, everyone. You too. You too. Thanks for Bye. participating.